Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the 3 o'clock meeting here in La Quinta. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Uh, Tony, would you please lead us in the pledge? Ready, begin. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> If the board will step down and join me in giving out the service awards to six La Quinta employees and also to recognize Tony Cagaban about completion of the apprenticeship program. That's really cool. This certificate of recognition and service pin replica of the district emblem are presented to Eric W. Grubaugh for 10 years of loyal and faithful service to the Imperial Irrigation District. For 10 years of service, David C. Taran. of service, James Andrew Hernandez. Dogs for 30 years of service, Stephen L. Rios. Years of service, Jerry M. Rowland. Mm 
Is there anyone who was to receive a service award today whose name I didn't call? That will uh, conclude the service awards. Now uh, we'd like to recognize Roy Tagabon for uh, receiving his journeyman card. Um, having satisfactorily completed training in accordance with apprenticeship standards is awarded this certificate attesting to the achievement of the skills and knowledge required of a journeyman. That's four years of coursework and 8,000 hours of on-the-job training. I've always maintained we have the best of the best working for the district. This proves it. Thank you. Um, now is the time for public comment. Uh, those that would like to wish to speak to the board, please come forward and state your name and address. Pardon me? Approval of the agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. That gentleman wanted to talk. I was, hold on, just give me two minutes. Um, may I have a, a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, if there's items to be pulled out of order or items to be pulled from the agenda, now is the Motion time to do to so. Motion to approve the agenda. As is? Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Did Were we looking at the action agenda? Yeah, the whole, all the agenda. Did you want to pull or change anything? If not, it's too late. We already voted on it. Okay. Now is the time for public comment. <laughs> Please come forward, state your name and address for the record, and please keep your comments to, do, to no more than five minutes. Did you really want to change something? About the 700, four minutes, I thought we central. That's just for you to, to review and take it back home. Oh. oh, okay, all right, well, when it comes to that, say that. Uh, my name is Leo Nasiak, and I live at 78515 Avenida Altimo in La Quinta. And I live just about across the street from the uh, Marshall uh, substation. And the reason I'm here today is I'm kind of representing the neighbors here in the Desert Club Estates. Uh, we have the substation there that uh, you folks own and operate. I, I assume you own it, but. Uh, uh, and it's not being maintained very well. Uh, I spoke with uh, a couple of people from IID, uh, a Carlton King, who came out and, and uh, told me that I should be grateful that it looks this good, to, that uh, I should see some of the other ones. Well, the reason that it looks so good is because I've been fertilizing it and I planted trees across the street because the trees died. Uh, we were trying to get them to turn the water on. The water's on for one minute a day. And uh, the bushes, basically the bushes have all, they've died at one time and they've all come back. I've got some pictures here. I didn't realize there were so many people. <laughs> so you'll have to share. Yeah, we'll share them. That's Thank you. The 
photo you'll see on the first page at the end of the road is is a property that's owned by the La Quinta Resort. Uh, the residents in the city got together and got the La Quinta Resort to clean up the end of the road. And um, if you're looking at the picture on the right-hand side where the, the minor, the small wall is, uh, the La Quinta Resort put in a wall for the IID location there to keep the water in and the dirt. Uh, the uh, IID is sometime in, in the latter part of 2009 came out and took down the 10-foot gates and now we have 40-foot uh, gates there, cyclone gates that you can really see the property inside the property. I tried to get uh, Mr. King to see about putting in some wooden slots in the, uh, the gates and stuff like that to kind of block off some of the, the look in IID. I also asked him if I could plant some plants across the street uh, you know, he said that you guys couldn't afford it, so I told him I would put some plants in, and then he said, well, you better not do that because it's going to cost us extra money to maintain it. Well, like I indicated to him, nobody's maintaining it anyways. Uh, he also promised uh, when he was out to see me, this was like in the latter part of January, that somebody would be out in the next two weeks to clean up the property, and he had some kind of a landscape fellow there, and well, nobody ever showed up. So I've been kind of just waiting to come to this one of these meetings to see about uh, maybe, you know, you folks can look into this and maybe get it cleaned up. You know, you want us to be good neighbors. You know, if somebody breaks in there or something like that, you know, you're going to come to us to ask us who, who it was or if we saw anybody. But, you know, it's, it's, just, it's just, a, just being good neighbors. Your property looks terrible. Um, it, and it shouldn't look like this. I mean, you know, this is, this is a small representation of the pictures. You'd have to see it to believe it. You know, there's no DG. There's dirt. We've complained about the dust and stuff like that. And unfortunately, I keep getting the same thing from uh, Mr. King. We, you guys have no money. And uh, I would... I'd like the board maybe to, you know, look into this and maybe be able to do something for the neighborhood, help straighten up the rest of it. You know, we did get the La Quinta Resort to clean up their property, and now the eyesore there is IIDs. Um, the other thing that I'd like to ask you about is I have a letter here from 2005 from a Carlos Partido, P-A-R-T-I-D-A, and it, and it refers to the overhead wires. Uh, they built a subdivision, uh, the Fairlane subdivision, Fairway subdivision, and they were supposed to bury, put the wires, the overhead wires underground. And this letter was sent to the city to release the bond money for, um, that was on that property. And in the letter, it indicates that IID would come back later that, uh, being that this was in the heyday of building and, 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 put, the, and put the lines underground. Uh, and at this point, nobody has, has done that. I made some copies of those letters for you, too. And maybe you can see why, <clears throat> why, the, why, the, why the, uh, the wires have never been put underground. Uh, I'd also like to just kind of mention about the uh, rebate program on the solar program. Um, I did try to apply for the solar program uh, this year and uh, I talked with uh, a Miss Sabrina Barber, who is extremely helpful and knowledgeable about the program. You know, I, she's been, you know, I indicated to her, or we talked about the fact that there was only 30 homes that uh, were able to capitalize on the program. And the biggest problem I had, and I indicated to her, and I'm not sure you folks are aware of this, is I was 15th in line on the day of the program opened up. And, before me, there was contractors who had 10, 20 contracts. And those 10, 20 contractors got all the business. They got the, the first, it was a first come, first serve basis. 
as a resident, <laughs> I wasted three hours standing in line because I was 15th, not really realizing that the contractors had more contracts than, than I had to, uh, to submit for the program. So again, I have to wait for another year. I did make some recommendations to her about that program, but I believe you folks need to take a look into that program and see you know, if it can be you know, operated a little bit more efficiently because it wasn't fair to me as a resident unless I signed a contract with a, with a contractor you know, I really, you know, to me that was a bargaining chip. If I had, the, if I had my own approval, I could, you know, negotiate with the contractor versus the contractor having my, my documentation and have no, no bargaining chips to, you know, to get the rebate. So, it's something that, you know, it should be, it's the, the, the program should, you know, uh, be more towards the resident versus the contractor. One contractor could have picked up 30 contracts and taken your $400,000 and, you know, he's got a guaranteed $400,000 and the other contractors in line, you know, they're never going to, they're never going to be able to get, uh, you know, any of the subsidy money. Uh, they also had two locations accepting the documents and nobody could tell me whose document they used first, if it was here or El Centro, I guess. You have to free. I haven't lived here that long, so some of my some of my knowledge isn't isn't as good as others. Uh, so I also asked about the fact that just recently they passed a uh, the federal government passed a law about 100% um, capitalization right off for businesses, and I questioned the fact that that uh, there was subsidies going to to businesses, you know, that could have been towards the residents. Uh, a business was able, from what I understand, businesses are able to write off 100% of capital expenditures. And I don't think it would, you know, it's fair that, that you guys would be giving uh, some kind of a rebate back to a business when they can write it off off the federal government and it'd be more advantageous for the uh, residents living here in the community to, to get the, the bulk of the money. Because there was only, I think she said $400,000 or something like that, enough for 30 homes and the bulk of it went to, to businesses. So it's just something that I found to be, you know, didn't seem, seem even, or, you know, on, on even grounds for me as a resident versus a contractor. And that would be it. So, but number one, I want to thank you for taking the time to come here and to talk to, to the board. Yeah. We are interested in your concerns and regarding the Marshall Street substation and the uh, undergrounding of the the lines. I'm going to pass this on to Mr. Kelly, and he'll look into it and he'll get back to you. And Miss Miss Barber is sitting right behind you, <laughs> Sabrina Barber, and so. <laughs> and we're aware of the issues with the solar uh, rebate program, and we're looking into it. And right. So, and I again want to thank you taking the time out of your daily life to come here and to talk to us. We really appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Anyone else that would like to come forward? If not, we will end the public comment period. Oh, we have, oh, we have one? Okay. That's right here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Terry Siemens, and just because I'm a single female, I'm, I'm a resident of the Coachella Valley. Um, Today I wanted to um, ask a couple questions of the board before I made any uh, comments myself, and that is, uh, first question is, how many of you are familiar with smart meters or consider yourself familiar? We know something about it. We haven't installed them ourselves, but we, we know about the product. Okay. Um, have any of you seen the SAGE report um, this is the first prior time. to today? Okay. No. Um, how about the EPRI report? Any of I, you? I don't think we have. Uh, the CCST report. Um, you could ask Dr. Colk, he's sitting right behind you. I, okay. No. I, yes, we, I briefly spoke with him last night. Um, I'm a little concerned that um, 
there's been apparently some discussion regarding smart meters and the publicly available documents and reports that are available at this time, which um, there's at least three of them out there that I'm familiar with. There may be a fourth one, which I can get you. Um, not this week, but next week I would be able to provide that as well. Um, of the three existing reports, um, I wanted to just at least alert you to uh, their availability and suggest that you do take a look at them before you make any decisions on submitting a final report to the federal um, government regarding um, smart grid implementation and how you will be upgrading your infrastructure to match that demand. Um, as you may or may not know, I'm surprised how many um, boards or um, city councils and local area governments um, are not aware that there is a wired option. And although Southern California Edison and some of the other public utilities have made decisions to go forth with a wireless option, that is by no means required to be um, smart grid compliant. I would urge you to take a look at these reports for a number of reasons. Um, there have been concerns about accuracy of the meters. Uh, there have been concerns about privacy. There's been concerns about what is being done with the data and the data mining that companies like Google and Oracle are considering and um, inquiring about, um, to name a few. Uh, in addition, um, probably the biggest concern has been the health concerns, and that's also been the most controversial. If you look at the various studies that have been done over a period of years, there are approximately 10,000 studies that make reference to various levels of uh, low-level EMF fields, um, and that would be lower than the thermal standard that's used by the FCC standards. By the FCC standards are very liberal in comparison with some of these standards, as low as one one-thousandth of the FCC standard have been shown to have biological effects within two hours on DNA. For that reason, I think that before you require every business and every homeowner in this um, area to have a wireless microwave radio frequency radiation emitting into their home 24 hours a day for the duration of that building, that you look a lot more closely at what the literature is and the reports that are out there. There were over 2,000 reports that can be named and, and a list provided for research that's been done in various levels of low-level um, electromagnetic fields, particularly those from radio frequency microwave. Typically, you'll hear about the RF frequencies. Those RF frequencies in terms of electrical consumption cannot, cannot um, transmit alone. They have to be carried on a microwave. So anytime you're talking about radio frequency, you're talking about microwave radiation. There are three levels to the smart meter infrastructure. The first level is to upgrade the pre-existing um, infrastructure, which in many cases is not sufficient. There have been a number of communities in the valley here where they've had to upgrade the transformers. Um, you'll notice in some neighborhoods there's um, uh, almost like a black spider web wiring affixed to some of the utility poles. In other cases, it's done underground. It's two things have resulted. A much higher level of background radiation from the microwaves, um, not tr only transmitting into the home, but outside the home equally with a dipole antenna. And most of these meters have uh, dual antennas, or in some cases, if they're a collector antenna, um, they have three of these me dipole meters. Now, the, the sad thing about these meters is when um, those antennas were approved by the FCC, they were approved for single use, and they're being used for double and triple use for co-location. Um, that's an FCC violation. Another concern is that this meter is protected by a patent. Therefore, there's a lot of information that we'd like to have that isn't available to the public because it's patent protected. Um, we're being forced in most cases to have these meters. The only exception I've heard that might be made is an accommodation for a pacemaker. 
And that's not always occurring. So if that does, you know, we're grateful for that. But there are a number of people who should not have this on their homes. And anyone who frankly wants to opt out ought to be able to do that. I don't want microwave radiation pulsing. I'm told that it's similar to the radiation coming out of a cell phone or a Wi-Fi or some similar type of device in the home. Well, in my home, I don't have Wi-Fi. I don't own a cell phone. These are decisions I've made by choice. And I want to keep my home a sanctuary because it's the only place I have when you upgrade the ambient airspace all around the community. And that's the only place I have to go as a resource for me. And there are a number of other people out here who have the same concerns. Now, you have an option to do wi wired. And I'm was told last night that that would cost an additional $23 per household per month. I'm not sure why it would be so extraordinarily more expensive, but regardless, if that's the difference between the, the rates of cancer and Alzheimer's and autism and everything else that's skyrocketing and has been shown to have some link to electro increased electromagnetic or electrical fields, I think we need to step back, slow down, and take a look at what's happening. The reports that I've given you, I want to just briefly mention, um, I've given you um, a cover sheet and a table of contents for the SAGE reports. This is the actual report. It's 100 pages. It came out at the beginning of January. It was the first of the three reports. Um, since that time, February 18th, there was released an update. What they found is um, in areas like San Francisco, they have what's called the Sundi program. And, it, and at that, at, in those locations, their meters are up to 4.8 times as powerful as the original meters that were um, uh, diagrammed in and uh, assessed in this initial report. So that's an update. In addition, there's been um, a group of expert scientists internationally who have responded to what is called the CCST report. And that was in response to Huffman Bill AB 37, which you should also become familiar with, um, and the parameters of what that might mean down line um, at the end of 2012 in, in the event that you do elect to go with smart meters. Um, there are about nine scientists here who've responded, and I think it's really important to take a look at that. That report was supposedly an unbiased body of science, group of scientists commissioned by the California State Legislature. Sadly, there were a number of really quality scientists on that, but in the end, what happened is much of the document of the report was cut and paste from things that were, um, they were, uh, brochures and things like that from the utility companies, which was kind of sad. Um, furthermore, the conclusions of that report did not match um, the, the, the contents in the body of the information that was in the report itself. Um, those conclusions um, apparently must have been added or changed after the report was written. Um, Alternatively, Sage Associates created a new set of conclusions that could have easily responded to the contents of the body of the report. Um, that's also included in here. Um, and when I say included in here, it's the um, larger version of the copy that I have for all of you. Um, and then there's um, the EPRI report, which is a really interesting one. It supposedly is the only industry report available. And it was um, created by a company that was supposed to be independent of the industry itself. But if you look, they have um, approximately 20 members of their management. And if you look on their website and see how many of those managers, in fact, came from various utility companies, it doesn't seem that independent um, upon closer look. Um, re re um, regarding the EPRI report itself, um, interestingly, they typically charge $5,000 per report if you want to have a copy of their report. But when they have something they want to get out to the public for whatever reason, then they they give away their reports for free far and wide to anyone that is interested in them. 
Um, in this case, they're giving it away for free, or at least they were up to a week ago. I went on the website um, a couple of days ago, and I wasn't able to locate it. And I don't know if that had anything to do with the fact that Sage Associates has written a response to the contents of that report, and also because there was a separate report, which I don't have with me today, and I apologize, but I will get that um, in a PDF file and send it on to you as well. Um, but in that report, it shows that um, the EPRI report, in fact, is comparing apples and oranges instead of apples and apples. And when the apples and apples are compared in some of its charts, some of the charts literally turn almost opposite of what the information said originally. So I assume it was a huge embarrassment for them, which is part of why it's been pulled um, publicly for at least temporarily until maybe some corrections are made. But at least the initial report was um, chocked full of errors. And I say this because the last word really hasn't been spoken Spoken. Southern California Edison has done no research that they've made publicly available themselves. The only research that's been done was this one study by the EPRI for which um, PG&E relied upon. Now, I know you are not an investor-owned utility, so you have a lot more um, ability to um, make uh, independent decisions. And I hope that for the, the residents and the ratepayers of the Coachella Valley and Imperial County as well, that you will consider a wired um, meter option. And um, I'd be happy to see that other, um, that some, some various scientists and things perhaps could address you at a future meeting, should you be interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'd also ask that this be copied um, for all of you. I just have the one copy. Um, I didn't, I, I knew there was probably going to be more than five, but I knew there were at least five, and it's a number of pages. You can also download it at Sage Reports if you want this and, and more. Hand it to Mr. Garber at the end, please. He'll take care of it. Okay. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to come forward at this time? If not, um, comments from board members? Director Sanchez, comment? No comment. Uh, Director Desert? Hey, yes, I have a couple comments. Uh, I'm still hearing uh, much concern and discussion out there about the RA issue and the Path 42 build-out issue. Uh, I think that the board and, and staff need to take a, a harder look at that, and we need to get some better feedback on that. Uh, in addition to the Path 42 and the RA issue, I know on the trip to Sacramento that uh, Board President Mendoza and, and General Manager uh, Kevin Kelly made uh, in an effort to resolve the RA issue, uh, I have, was anticipating that they were going to have a, a green energy generators letter in support with signatures. Uh, as uh, was mentioned in, in the idea of Director Sanchez, it's a great idea. And, and it concerns me that this letter of support for not only the RA issue, but just a letter of support for the green energy generators and the importance to the economy of the Imperial Valley and our neighbors here in Riverside County. Uh, it, it just concerns me, and I'd like to see that, that letter put together in time to make it to the Green Energy Summit that's coming up. And finally, the third comment uh, is a water issue comment, and I know we don't do water issues here in La Quinta, but uh, there's some concerns I'd like to air out uh, to the board members and the general manager and people in the audience. Uh, the, uh, the All-American Canal. I uh, understand there's some financial concerns in regards to some repairs that were done down there uh, after the earthquake, the Easter earthquake we had this past year. So these are some of the information I'm hearing back from uh, the voters and the residents and the rate payers of the IID. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Menville? Uh, yes. Uh, tomorrow I will be at the Colorado River Board uh, meeting in Ontario. And uh, I know, I, I think Dave Koch, at your energy deal, you're going you're gonna to talk a little bit about the Sorry. megawatts, Generator. Path 42, and some of the generators. I have some questions I want to ask you on that. Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Director Hanks? Yeah, I just uh, would like uh, Dr. Koch to follow up on the presentation that was made here during board comments on these uh, smart meters. I, I know that. Uh, we have an interest in it as an industry, but um, some of these health issues is the first I've heard of it. I'd like to know a little more about it. Um, Mr. Garber? No comments, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes, briefly, 
<clears throat> President Mendoza, um, uh, I'm mindful that we don't discuss water matters here, but I do want the record to show that on March 29th, the uh, ID will conduct a public workshop on uh, water storage, and that will be at 5 p.m. at the uh, ID Auditorium in El Centro. That's it. All right, that's it. Then uh, going forward with the consent agenda, may I have a motion to approve? Move for approval. Is there a second? Uh, I'll go ahead and second. I'd like to make one co correction on the minutes. Uh huh. On um, page eight, I, I say a correction. Uh, on number 10, local entity uh, refers to uh, Director Hanks recuse himself as one of his family members. I'd like to change that to a relative. <laughs> Somebody's been disowned. Okay. Thank you. President Sanchez, I'm Mendoza, excuse me. Uh, as we're going over the consent agenda, uh, we talked a little earlier about one of the items on their action for the 700 forms, the appendix amendment. Uh, should we bring that up at the time? If what, what number is that? That's not on, I think that's on action, isn't it's, it? It's not under consent. Okay, we'll bring it up at that time. Yeah, it'll come up on action. Okay. Um, was, was there a second for the motion? Yeah, it's second. Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. <coughs> Going on to information. Um, please. Page 28 of your agenda, item number four. Um, <coughs> Mr. Marcial, you'll be talking about the portfolio management uh, office. And this is an update. Doesn't require any action. I got it. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. First of all, we're going to talk about a little bit about some of the activities that are going on in the PMO. <coughs> we're working with uh, the finance team and reviewing a draft of some adjustments to. Uh, policy 1080, we've discussed this before, and we're continuing to do that. Uh, we have uh, two new employees on board, two coordinators. Uh, they started this Monday, and they're in, in training at this time. Um, there's a new coordinator position that, was, that has been posted for here for La Quinta. Uh, that's about to close, and we'll be interviewing for, those, uh, for that position soon. <clears throat> we're also planning to post a temporary position for a technical writer. That's going to help us in standardizing RFPs, RFQs, bids, requirements, and so forth for the various business areas. Uh, PMO has already started to work with the uh, IT department on the PMO management tool, on gathering requirements for that, and uh, that's that uh, uh, work task is just starting up. We're also working with IT and our upgrade contractor to correct uh, the last remaining issues from uh, the upgrade project. <coughs> Excuse me. This includes a, a, an issue, an old issue, that was present there before the upgrade. Uh, it's a deposit issue on projects. Right now that's not working properly and we're addressing that and that's going to be coming in with the, uh, with the upgrade, the last work of the upgrade fixes. <coughs> We we'll also have we'll have an, a draft uh, RFP ready this week for uh, general project <coughs> management training. This is going to be available for the entire company. This is basic training, and we're going to be inviting uh, different business areas to participate in that training as well. So that's uh, going to be available sometime uh, uh, in the next couple of weeks. We'll release that uh, RFP. <coughs> We're working on adjusting the organizational structure to meet some of the needs, some of the requirements from the board. We're working with the HR and the executive team, and we'll be having a presentation of that uh, next week uh, for you. 
We're also, uh, upon the request from the general manager, we're adjusting the manager's watch list that comes into your quarterly reports. We're uh, including more information. We're not only including what we call the red items, the items that need uh, immediate attention by the managers, but we're also including uh, items that of note that the manager should be aware of. Uh, that is usually that information is contained in the report itself, but now we're going to highlight that information. You're going to see that in the December report, and uh, I've seen that first draft uh, of that uh, uh, that list, and it's the, a number of items have grown from one page to about five pages. So you'll see everything that uh, it's is contained in the reports being highlighted in that manager's action uh, list, and we'll have that for you soon. So those are some of the activities that are that we're uh, uh, conducting right now. <clears throat> the next part uh, of the presentation is a review of the standard operating procedure policy. Uh, I've done this presentation uh, several times to the different business units. This usually takes me about an hour and a half. You don't have an do. hour and a half, I know. Mr. Marcial. We have just a few minutes, so I'm going to point <laughs> at some of the highlights uh, of, of the policy. Uh, of the of the major work authorization, uh, this uh, uh, a standard operating procedure expands on the policy in several areas. Uh, it highlights the accountability for roles and responsibility. It uh, uh, fleshes out the expenditure authorization, and I'm going to go through the document right in a second. And it expands and defines the required information for a uh, to support the decision-making process for the executive team and for the board, and you will see that. This lays out a foundation uh, for the company to, to accomplish what I just mentioned. This lays out, gives us a common process for the project managers to follow uh, for expenditures, for information reporting, and for escalation. Ex escalation process, <coughs> excuse me. It gives us a common language for the uh, project managers in the business to use, and in general, it improves the project management practice at the IID. You can go to page 10. <coughs> For the accountability piece, we define three roles. The owner, the project engineer, and the project manager. Uh, along with the accountability of, of a project for an owner, we gave the responsibility and the authority to start a project, stop a project, to uh, seek funding for a project. The engineer is in charge of any technical decisions, and the manager is responsible for the process and to make sure that collaboration among teams happens. So that's something that was, that's was that been discussed here at the board and that's been uh, in somehow defined in the roles of the policy. And we went ahead and defined this in the standard operating procedure. And these are the three main roles throughout the document that uh, uh, are, are the players in the document. The majority of the document is procedures for the project manager to follow on how to, how to uh, do uh, changes to a project, how to uh, uh, record those, and how to follow the process. Page 15. <coughs> right there. The second piece of the uh, policy discusses the expenditure uh, authorization process. And it's kind of mixed in there with expenditure authorization and the project uh, process as well. And what we decided to do here is to uh, uh, separate that so that we can see what is required in order for the expenditure authorization. And essentially, it's three steps, three pretty simple steps. We have the first step is to initiate a project, and we'll go right now through what is required to initiate a project. 
Step two is a major work authorization start request. That's the package that comes to you for approval. And then the step three is a finish request, which is really a notification from the project owner uh, informing the project manager to uh, finish a project. And it's really simple, it's just a notification. There's really not a whole lot of information that's needed. So it's three steps for the expenditure authorization. <coughs> so here we have a definition of a, of a project, project life cycle. We're implementing a phase gate approach. These are the different phases of a project and the different decision gates or approval gates that are necessary for a project. These will be implemented according to the size and complexity of a project. We don't want to overburden every project with putting all these phases and all these approvals. A large project will require uh, much of this. A very small project will not. So it's up to the owner and the project manager to choose what is appropriate for the type of project that they're running. So here's the information that's required in order to register a project. Okay. The name, the scope, description, the business area, if it's energy, water, the proposed start and finish date, projected costs, the owner, the strategic initiative, the location, and the funding source. That's the information that I need in order to get a project into the system and get a uh, a number for it. The project can't spend any money, that's just putting it into the system. That's all we require. That's it. Two, three. Scroll a little bit up. Now, a little bit down. Right there. Now, in, in order to initiate a project, a development project for a major work authorization, in other words, to spend up to $200,000, a through I was what I needed to register a project. I just need, in order to spend $200,000, up to $200,000, I need to know the engineer, the development phase budget, the start and finish dates, the funding source, and a deliverable list for development. That's all I need, simple. We've simplified the requirements that were, were in place before in order to start a development project and capture those costs. Before, uh, PMO was asking so much information that people were just starting the development work and we were not capturing those costs. So we recognized that that was, we were asking for too much information and now we're making it very, very simple, very, very straightforward in order to start capturing those costs from the very initiating or very start of a project. Go on. That's it. Now, I'm going to ask you to go all the way to the end of the, of the document, page 58. <laughs> then the next phase is the major work authorization start phase. The major work authorization document is what comes to you for approval. What page is that? It's on page 58. It starts on page 58. Okay. So, in talking to the different air business areas, they asked us that they wanted a simpler way to do the major work authorization. They wanted to fill in the blank as much as possible. Now, not every project will be able to use this template, but the majority will. And we, what we did was we created a template where you can fill in the blank uh, and uh, start a major work authorization. And we went through the policy and we made sure that all the items that were required from the policy were in there. In addition, we added a couple, a couple few items there that are not policy-based, but 
as a, a, an owner of a project, as a board, we feel that uh, those would be advantageous for your de decision process. And I'll point those out. So there's four sections of this uh, for the major work authorization. The first section defines the business issue. What are you trying to fix? What is the problem? Section two is your proposed solution. Section three is the PMO major work authorization review. That's the, our independent review of the MWA that we give you and you've seen before. Section four is the expenditure authorization. That's our standard signature page that you've seen. And then section five is all the support information, the detailed support information. Can you go to Mr. Marcial, yes, ma'am. To do all this process on a project, how much time will it take to do all this documentation that you need? <coughs> In order to start uh, a development development work, in other, in other words, in order to get the, the information that we require in order to spend up to $200,000, you saw there's only about 10 pieces of information that we needed. Essentially, what is the project? How much are you spending? Where are you getting the money from? And the deliverables for the development In phase. your experience, how much time will that take? When to get that? Yeah, to, to... It takes longer to get the the route the document for signatures for the different approvals than to come up with that information. Okay. It's, it's not very long. Okay. We're trying trying to make it as simple as possible. Now here is the major work authorization piece is all policy based. So there's a lot of more information that's there and, and we're putting this template out there for people to use to make it easy for them so they don't forget information. But it's a template. If they don't want to use it, they can use something else. And we just have to go through that document and make sure that all the elements of the policy are met. But if they look at this template, all the policy requirements should be there. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Do, are, do cost benefit analysis, are they included in the this pro policy now or this yes. SLP? You'll see it. Were they, were they included before? The cost benefit analysis? The, SO, the SOP. This is the first time we've had the uh, standard operating procedure for MWAs. Okay, thank you. Okay, so there's a table of contents. Can keep on going. And here is what we need to explain the business issue the issue description, what is the impact to the business, any special circumstances we might, know, we might need to know, for example, if there's uh, an urgency to the to the issue and a justification piece. <coughs> section two. Now here's section two. Here's how we're going to solve the problem. You have a project description. What, what is the solution type? It is strategic. Is it uh, regulatory compliance? Are we improving efficiency? What type of this? What's the lifespan of the solution? Is it a temporary solution or permanent? A little description of the solution. Some assumptions. The assumptions piece is not part of the major work authorization policy. Okay, so but that we asked for that. So here's the uh, strategic initiative. Uh, we made it easy. We put them on there. All you do is check the box that's appropriate. Okay, the project team. Here's the owner, engineer, and, and manager. And if there's a contract engineer, the engineer of record. Uh, contract services required. Um, we just asking for a little description of the service agreement, service required, and if it's going to be a bid, RFP, sole source, what is it going to be? There's been a lot of discussion about is this a sole source or not? We're putting it in a table, and all you have to put in there right up front, this is going to be a sole source service agreement, and you'll know right away. Deliverables. Major deliverables, we don't want every nut and bolt, we just want to know, you're going to put nine miles of line, you're going to do an upgrade to a line, what are you going to do? And what is the asset that you're going to modify? Angel, I have a follow-up question on the cost-benefit analysis. Sure. Because from what I still understand is, your job is people give you numbers. And every day, every week, every month, the numbers that are given to you, you're adding, subtracting making sure the numbers are fitting to what the numbers were given to you. The cost-benefit analysis, shouldn't that be the expertise of the energy manager saying, 
he doesn't know the engineering cost because he's not an engineer, but he, he gets benchmarks. He knows from his past experience. He knows from um, past how much heat goes into a certain boiler or and how much power it produces and how much it costs back then and, and where the costs are going. Um, so the, with the cost benefit analysis, that are you are you looking to that to be your job or is that still I th um, the energy manager's job and yours is just give me the numbers and ev I keep you accountable every day every week that the numbers what you told me you're on track. Okay, the, there's there's uh, project costs, which is uh, we want to see what the cost for the project's going to be. That's what we keep track of. The cost-benefit analysis is generated by the department. It's reviewed by the risk manager. And that's usually if there's payback to the investment or if there's payback by efficiencies. Who's the team that creates the cost-benefit analysis? It, it's, we facilitate it, but it's the project owner, uh, which includes the department manager and, and anybody in the department that's involved, and the risk manager. And we get that information and we make sure that it's in the um, uh, package that you have, that you get for approval. All right, thank you. Okay, let's go down. So here's the deliverables. Then we ask for a schedule. Uh, here's the different phases again, development, design, engineering, construction. These are the different phases. We ask for a start end date. Here's the financials now. Uh, so is this cost estimate final or preliminary? In the, in the policy, uh, if it's a preliminary uh, estimate, and then right when we get the final estimates before construction, if that estimate is above the preliminary estimate, it has to come back for the board. So this will tell you if it's a final or preliminary. Sometimes that is buried in text in an MWA, and we're putting it right out there, okay? So here's uh, the funding. Here's the cash flow. This is what we're look. This is what we're we're looking at. This is the estimated expenditure for the project for the life of the project, and that's what one of the things that we track. The cost benefit analysis. Here's a summary of the results, just in that present value in the payback period. The the detail is back in the end. Operation and revenue. This piece is not um, uh, policy based. This is not part of the policy, but we're looking at, we're asking, can you give us the current uh, monthly operation maintenance cost or revenue? And after the project, can you give us what it's going to be in the future? And again, this is not in the policy, but we're asking for that. Alternatives considered, this is not part of the policy either, but we're adding it. What are the alternatives to take a look at? The do nothing alternative, did you choose that or not? Alternative one, alternative two, which one did you choose? And what were they? Risk assessment. Again, this is not part of the policy, but we're asking for it. That gives a heads up to the project manager on what to look for. Do we have all the right of way? Do we have all the engineering done? How complex is this project? And that's a way for the owner to let us know. Because sometimes the project manager may not have that expertise. So we're relying on the different departments to let us know. Change orders. <coughs> Communication no. plan, we're making a real simple communication plan. This is pretty much all filled out already. So we just uh, talk about who the audience is, what the communication is going to be, how they're going to uh, provide it, and the frequency of it. And if the team needs to adjust that, they can adjust that. But again, it's, it's already filled out for them. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. And key stakeholders. This is not part of the policy, but we're trying to find out who is, where is this project, when this project gets built, who is it going to affect? Is there anything that we need to know to make sure that there's not an adverse effect? Either a certain area, a certain customer, a group of customers, uh, some, some contingent. And here's the, uh, uh, section three is the uh, PMO analysis. That's that one sheet front and back that we give. We make sure that everybody talks to each other, that everybody's uh, uh, looked at the MWA and everybody's signed off on it. So that's on section three. And section four is the authorization page that you have all been asking for. And section five is detailed information. All the detailed information, you have detailed spreadsheets and all kinds of things in there. And that's I, it. I have a question. Um, <coughs> 
parts of, of this document when you say they're not part of the policy, what guarantee that you have, do you have that staff is going to go in and put in that information if it's not part of the policy? None. None? You None. just... We, we were putting it in there. Uh, we think it's, it's a good idea to put those things in there. It's valuable for a decision-making process, not only for the so exact team. If they team. choose not to put in that information, then, is it? Uh, then really, we have, we have no uh, uh, power to force any, anybody to put that okay. in there. Okay, just like this template. We're, t we're treating it as a template. Here it is for you to use. If you elect not to use it, you elect how to use it, but if you want a simple fill-in-the-blank template that adheres to the policy, here it is. Use it. Okay. On the signature page, Angel, is there a sequential order that these they need to sign off, or does it matter the order? It, it should be. It should be in that order. So that the date that they sign and it should be it should fall one and the other. Yes. So we did that in in, in sequential order. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to make sure that the. Uh, that the owner is okay with, with the document, that the risk manager, that the cost benefit analysis is there, the controller budget analyst has made sure that the budget is there to do this project. And if I see those, then I'll go ahead and sign it. Uh, at times they had uh, the, the portfolio management officer all the way at the bottom, but it didn't make sense because if we found something incorrect with the document, it had to go for signatures all the way again. So I wanna catch it way up the front Again, try to make be as efficient as possible. If there's any issues with a document, we can go and, and correct that quickly without having the general manager or the department manager sign all these things. So we, that's why our name is there. The, the order is very uh, uh, yeah. deliberate. Yeah, Angel, can you explain why that particular order, especially the top four or five? Because I would, it wouldn't the project. I mean, who who develops the ideas? Is it the project? department manager, shouldn't he be the first signature if he develops the idea? Well, this is, this is an expenditure authorization document, right? So we, uh, our, our purpose of looking at this is to make sure that the document has, adheres to the policy, it explains things well, and everything is in order. So we want to make sure that that's the case, and we work with the owner, we work with the uh, uh, budget analyst and the risk manager to make sure that's that's okay. The document has already gone through the department and been worked on, and it now it's to the point where this is the final review. So the, the, usually the department manager has already seen these these documents already. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that you have taken this document to, to staff and given them an hour and a half presentation. What was the uh, reaction of the folks you talked to? Did they uh, embrace it? Did they say you're no. nuts? What, <laughs> what was their reaction? Um, I can see Dr. Coke smiling <laughs> over here. <laughs> um, without naming any names, uh, in some cases, the first things that I heard was, well, it's too long. It's way too long. All right. So I asked them, give me 90 minutes. And then after the 90 minutes, I want to ask you a question. So we've gone through the document, and we went through the 90 minutes. And uh, the one of the one time I asked, well, "What do you, is it too long?" And and the manager said, "No." In a in another case, we went. I asked the same thing. Give me the 90 minutes, and I'll go through this document. <coughs> okay. I went through the document. And again, the first comments were, this is too long, it's too, you know, we can't understand it, it's too much, it's too much, it's too much. After the 90 minutes, that group asked me to add a section to the document. Okay. So, so uh, it's really a document that, um, it are, it's instructions for the project manager to follow. We had a problem uh, when it first went around a problem that different business areas told me, well, depending on the different project manager that I get, I have to do things differently. So this is, I needed to, I need to build a foundation. But this is a uniform. This yeah. is a uniform way of doing things. It's a foundation that we can all work off of. Um, Any comments or questions from, from the board, uh, <coughs> Director Sanchez? When, when you, when Director, President Mendoza said staff, 
we, um, how many people did you present this to? Is this just the staff that is here today? We're talking about you're going you go into into deep middle management, which represents about 200, 300 employees. Or about two, three hundred, but uh, definitely. Uh, 7,500 people probably. Yeah. And 7,500 people of, of management, they, department heads, they were comfortable. And sometimes several, with, excuse me. They were, the 7,500 department heads were comfortable with your um, presentation. Oh no, this is a compromise Compliments. document. There's, there's some right. things that people don't agree with. There's some things that, you know, I, I have uh, some feelings for. And, and in some cases, uh, water department, wants it a certain way, energy department wants it a different way, and they're both upset at me because I'm not doing it one way or the other. I'm, I'm trying to find a middle ground and say, okay, this is the best way to work, and neither area is, is happy about it. So uh, it's a compromise document. So I can't say that everybody embraces this 100%, but I think it's, it's pretty good and it's workable, and uh, we can revisit it as we go along. What I want to do is I want to try it, put it on there. We're going to find some issues here and there. We'll adjust it. Director Desert. Yeah, uh, Angel, I've I got a couple of uh, comments of, on specific pages, and this is mainly in regards to uh, some type of uh, reporting back to the board, either dotted line or solid line. On, on page 36, Uh, section 5.2.4, it says the project owner will immediately inform management and the Imperial Irrigation District Board when expenditures are anticipated to exceed the approved major work authorization. Yes. It, is it proper for the, the project owner to do that with his direct line of reporting and communication, or should the PMO actually be the one there in that section? <clears throat> When we when we define the the, di the three different roles, uh, project owner, project manager, project engineer, uh, the project owner is in charge of scope and funding. Okay, so any funding issues, the owner needs to go and get funding. The owner needs to go and and do all that work. So that's how we divided that work. We're in charge of process. Um, so if there isn't funding or we exceed funding that's where we come in and say okay we can't spend any money because we have no funding so the owner is not going to have a choice secondly we have our avenue of escalating that with the manager's watch list so you will see that as well in in our way we have an independent way of bringing that to your attention that there's a project that's lacking some funding so we put the responsibility on the owner to a good funding, but we will also bring it up and we will alert you that there's a funding issue with a particular project. And, uh, and then I had the same concern on page 39, uh, section 6.4, 6.4.2. It says the project owner is responsible to provide status reports to the Imperial Irrigation District Board of Directors as required. Here again, that would, the project owner wouldn't be reporting, wouldn't it be PMO? In, in some cases, it's it's uh, PMO, and in some cases, it's uh, uh, the owner. For example, Unit 3 Repower, the owner comes in and provides you those detailed status reports. We provide the status reports on a monthly basis uh, uh, anyways. And then 6.4.1, right above that, it says, periodically, the Imperial Irrigation District Board of Directors request project status reports for particular projects. And shouldn't that be quarterly or monthly per uh, policy 1080? Again, we, we're, we're trying to make this as, as generic as possible. If the policy changes, then we adhere to whatever that policy is. So we say periodically, if the policy is quarterly, it's quarterly, if it's monthly, it's monthly. We adhere to whatever the policy is. And then on page 40, section 6.5.4, it says the project owner is accountable for producing and delivering post-project reports yes. to the management team and the Imperial Irrigation District General Manager. So here again, the, the project owner will be participating. Sometimes the project owner will be presenting to the board, and sometimes the PMO will be presenting to the board, as you made an example of Unit 3. <clears throat> Let me talk in particular about uh, post-project reports. Um, 
the PMO does not create the justification for a project. Sometimes the PMO, uh, excuse me, the project owner will justify a project by uh, claiming efficiencies, by claiming sa other kinds of savings. And we don't, we don't crank, uh, crank out those numbers, the owner does. So after a project is complete, the owner should be the one coming back to the board and, and, and verifying those numbers uh, to you. Yes, we are saving so much. Yes, we, we increased uh, our efficiencies by X number of percent. We don't have that information to give back to you. The owner and the operational areas have that detail of information. So we will help do this post-project report, but any if, if the project is justified with any efficiencies or any cost savings, we want the owner to be responsible to give us that information. Otherwise, if if we don't have access to that data, then we won't be able to provide accurate information. So we're, we're making them responsible for, for justifying the project and verifying at the end of the project for that. And sometimes, Bill, presenting to the board is a little bit difficult. And so the, when the project owner is there presenting the, the PMO, you'll, you'll be there behind him and be sure. on board to what, what this information is in case he needs assistance on his presentation? Yes, we're, we're, we're creating post-project reports already for the 2010 uh, projects. And, and there's a couple where we're working with a customer already to make sure that all the data is intact. It's a one-page summary of the report. And if there's any uh, uh, savings uh, claimed at the justification piece, then those will be in there and verified. And, and finally, on page 23, uh, this is section 2.1.11. It says, the major work authorization start request and the PMO major work authorization review are routed to the PMO, CFO, and the CAO for review and approval. <coughs> uh, shouldn't the general manager be in, in that line of command there rather than the CAO? Or should he, the general manager be added in addition? Yes. Yes, so we need to. We need to. Um, so the CEO comes out and the GM goes in, or does the GM go in and? Can we go back to that uh, uh, signature page? Mr. Escalera, could you lower the temperature? It's getting warm in here. Thank you. <coughs> Talking too much. Yeah, a lot of hot air. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there, there's what we were asking for. So this, we need to adjust this. This is what we're asking for right there. And so at the board is in the bottom. So the general manager will be in there? Yes. At the bottom? Well, the, at the board is at the bottom, actually. That's if we scroll down a little bit more. You have oh, the so they are, the general manager is in there? Yes, sir. But we just need to correct the code? We need to correct it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, yeah, I, I just add, I don't, Mr. Marcial, you've been working on this a long time. Uh, like you say, it's a compromised document. Yes. It's a living document. Yes. I think as you move forward, there'll be further changes to tighten yes. things up. Yes, sir. So that everybody's uh, somewhat comfortable with working with it. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? So this is uh, yeah. Director Hanks. I've got some yeah. comments. Mm -hmm. yeah. A um, couple of things I'd like to point out. Uh, this this uh, SOP is riddled with shared responsibility, and, and I really don't see that ultimate responsibility and with that reporting function to the, the uh, solid line to the general manager and the dotted line to the board. I don't know who that is. You know, it's not really specified. Uh, it looks like there's four people sharing some responsibility here. Uh, and I think it's, it's very important that the, uh, the general manager uh, feels like that the, that the project management has his back on these projects. You know, if there's something going haywire and you have the project owner as a guy, the way it appears right now, the, the ultimate what I call ultimate uh, responsibility as a project owner. And that's a mixed bag, bag with oversight. To me, it's not a separate desk. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that the signature page that you have here is consistent with our board policy. 
I need to go back and, and look at that. Look like it's, you know, I, ha I had some questions on that. The, and one of the main questions I have is the, the final product, uh, the closure of the final product. Uh, I, I see nowhere in there where, where you bring notice of completion to the board. You know, it's it's I, on page 56, I believe it was. It even goes so far as to say that a project may be closed when all project work is not complete if the project owner, department manager, CFO, chief administrator, or general manager is willing to accept the responsibility of not providing all the deliverables as planned. Work not completed will be recorded with a project change request. It was my understanding that there had to be a notice of completion for the release of that last payment. <clears throat> There's I'd like to see that in it. That last payment is withheld to the board approves it. There's, uh, I didn't see that in the policy, but there's a section for closing of, of a project, and that's actually the longest section of any of the procedures, and we can go through that if you like. However, the notice of how a project performed and that closure is with that post-project report. That's, and, and that post-project report in policy says that goes to the general manager. It doesn't come to the board. So the policy doesn't speak uh, uh, of anything coming to the board for project closure. It says if those post-project reports are going to go to the general manager. Well, I'd, I'd like to go back and look at some, uh, some of the policy because I, I ran across a policy one time. I, I didn't write down the number that it required a notice of completion. And, and let me tell you why that's important. Um, if, um, if we're using certain type funds and, and we're required to pay prevailing wages, and if there is a complaint or a challenge on the, on the project, because uh, some of the uh, contractors employees say hey we were not paid prevailing wage okay we have a responsibility to audit those to make sure it's happening if it's not reported to us and if we we don't catch it and the project is closed it's my understanding it becomes our responsibility so you know at the close of a, of a project there are warrants that kick in. There's guarantees that kick in. Uh, you know, and there needs to be a specific timeline established for that purpose. You know, we, we still have some issues on the um, Pika Plant in Island. Mm -hmm. uh, there was reports that came in under budget, but we know there's there's still some issues out there that that we're dealing with. I think some of it legally, but. The, the question is, okay, when does the warrant on, on this equipment start? When, you know, uh, is, it, is it limited to just an area where we're having difficulty? Or is it on the whole operation? I don't remember it ever being accepted as completed. But I think it, in terms of warranties and guarantees, uh, especially if we've been running the plant for a couple of years, there could be some, some issues. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's why I'd like to see uh, a provision in here, where on a notice of completion, particularly where where bond money is used, that that come forward. Are you referring to a notice of completion that's recorded with all the construction projects to address stop notices and things like that, or are you talking about some kind of notice to the board? I'm, I'm talking about the completion of the project that we're accepting the project now. We now accept ownership of it. The notice that. The notice that a government entity files on a public works job yes. with the county recorder. Yes. The purpose of that notice is to put parties on notice as to certain types of claims can be made. And in public right. works, it's very limited. It's basically stop notice claims. Um, it yes. also may trigger, depending on how the contract yeah. is. There may, there may be a subcontractor that hasn't been paid. 
Stop notice claim. Yeah. yeah, and we have to file, and he has a, a time period that he can put a, a stop payment notice. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Sir, you don't file a Well, we have other items to talk about. There are some laws that those that date can be assumed based on certain things. But what I'm confused at is that's not something that gets reported with the board. You may want them to notify that. But not all projects need a notice of completion. It sounds like what you're looking for is some type of communication to the board that a project's done. Only certain types of public works projects get a notice of completion. There may be other projects that are done that don't. So I'm just a little confused because I think what you want is notification to the board that a project has been completed, right? Yeah, well, if you, if, especially if, if a project's going to be uh, determined to be closed and the work's not complete 12, and materials haven't arrived, you know, I, I would think the board would want to know about it. Well, and alternatively, you're, you're rightly concerned about projects that just hang around and stay open. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, that's come up in, in our discussions to that's this correct. point, too. Um, yeah, I'm just asking for some, some type of yeah, well, I, the, stamp or something on there. Yeah, yeah. that it's completed, right. um, and that's the uh, final step. That's the post-project report, yes. right? So that would be uh, uh, routinely. Um, I mean, that would be captured in in your um, uh, yes. model. Yes. And next week, um, as an informational item, I just want to alert the board that uh, that we'll be back with a new um, uh, improved. We think. PMO model, um, a more robust and centralized PMO model um, that uh, that will retain the the uh, dotted line relationship to the board, um, but will actually have, uh, we think, uh, it will provide for a um, a reporting mechanism that will actually. Uh, give the board actionable intelligence that you can then make uh, better decisions on. So, um, uh, yeah. okay. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of these SOPs are in place now, but the org chart's going to change. You know, so it's gonna. You know, I'm I'm not sure whether the org chart should have came first and then SOPs. Uh, a lot of this information is applicable, especially the project processing is applicable to to small projects, large projects. So well, but the main thing is, that, you know, that that you said this thing will change as as we move along, and will we'll make the thing work. But I I think that uh, in terms of uh, accountability, um, there's there's shared accountability, but yet. There's somebody that's ultimately in charge, and then the reporting function. Whenever you start hearing the board talk about this solid line to the board, that's 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 coming up because the dotted line's not functioning. Right. And who is that person that has that responsibility to report it? Okay. See, and our policy it doesn't say the project owner. Mm -hmm. It says the PMO officer. Is, is a person accountable to, to re reporting that. Okay. So when, when that doesn't happen, then you, when that salt line comes up, that's usually yep. the reason. Okay. Well, you know, I, I think probably that uh, the, the best way to think about it, and this will become clear next week, and then in the subsequent week when we present it to you for a vote, um, the responsible party under this model that uh, Angel and others have developed uh, ends up being the general manager, whoever that is. Yep. Um, but uh, this model is, it, it doesn't work, and this would be a failure if over the course of a year it never rose to the level that the board, through that dotted line uh, function, uh, didn't get uh, some sort of, of uh, uh, feedback on a particular project because there are so many of them, it's impossible that they're all perfect. And we know they're not. Um, are you done, Director Hanks? Yes. Okay, thank you, Director Sanchez and um, Director Menville. Then we'll go on to the next item. And I just want to thank you for um, oh, bringing this report to us and giving us a, a more of an idea. You know, as <laughs> me, as one director, you, and you look out into different directors and different people, how they 
they kind of you, you pick some where, where, where it works better than others for example we just heard centralization um, local control streamline yet it looks like you're taking the process of where the PO has the idea and then the cost-benefit analysis seems like an independent team uh, Belen with all the information that the, the project owner who developed the idea then gives it to the project team and tells them okay go find out how much materials cost and et cetera, et cetera. And then you're over here independent saying, okay, I'm gonna keep this accountable every day, who, how much money you're spending. So it seems like three different, four different parts, but at the end of the day, I think the one who makes the most money, so to speak, which probably the one who makes the decisions, the project owner, um, the one who develops the ideas, that's who we pay, should be held accountable. Mm -hmm. um, so I like that, that he's coming up, coming to the board. Um, again, he's not going to be perfect as well. I don't want to scare any department heads or anything like that. I mean, that's why you have contingencies, and I think I'm, for one director, somewhat, you know, understand that. Um, but uh, uh, the thing that I've always seen is a change of work orders, and I think between all those different separation, and it could see you could you know you could see how it could function, and, and as well as um, our general manager um, uh, Kevin, my block. Um, what he just said is that at the end of the day, that's his team. And if he sees us frustrated, three or more board members frustrated with you guys, he's got to make a change or we're going to make a change on him. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, I, I see the separation and I like that and I like the accountability on the person who develops the idea because at the same time, if his idea works, then he's going to get promoted, et cetera, et cetera, and all the benefits. And if he doesn't, you know, maybe that's not the right job for him. Doesn't mean he's going to get fired or anything, but... Thank I think accountability Director is important. Thank so, you. Thank you, Angel. All right. Director Desert. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see the uh, organizational chart with this the next time you present it, and just to better see that functioning dotted and solid line reporting function, especially that there's going to be multiple uh, persons sharing in the ownership or reporting and re functioning other projects. Thank you. Excuse me, Stella. I wasn't done. You kind of cut done? me off. I, I'll oh. have one more comment. Okay. I was just going to say that, Angel, I can see where the dotted line comes up to the board because if the people don't bring it to the board it is your responsibility to bring it to the board and that's what you've said so i can see that dotted line and i just hope that uh, we keep it that way thank you do you need more time director sanchez are you done then okay cool it's now the time to ask questions on the uh, change order you, you the supplement that you gave us on change orders uh, yeah go ahead what? You had three. Yeah. Um, and just looking at the, the change orders, we're, Isn't that the agenda? This? we're roughly up to uh, uh, somewhere between four and a half, five million dollars worth of change orders. And this is, uh, if, I, if I recall, this, this project is, a, is a roughly a $250 million project. Um, so we're about 2%. And we're just getting started uh, with with the change orders that's coming in. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, is are we are we running into uh, structural issues, uh, or is it design, or is it just? Uh, <coughs> There's going to be a, a a presentation by the team next week. But in, in answer to, to, to your question, the, the, the project was defined at a high level. And when the team gets, finishes the engineering and they get that detail known, they create a change order to, to uh, contractually put in place that detail. For example, they, they say they're going to build the foundations and when they find find the final detail of the foundations they and that budget line item could be a million dollars in the budget for foundations and it's there it's in the VA when they find out what exactly the, that scope of the foundations are going to be and everything that's that's the contractor is going to be responsible for they create a change order to put in that detail so it, it, it's some of these are actual change orders, and some of these are are um, a, a uh, 
a finalization of, of the scope detail of that line item. So you'll see some things Director that, Hans, that are there. Yeah. Could we put, bring this back an information for the next meeting so that the responsible person in charge can come back and answer the questions that, yes. that you Well, that, that would be good. I, and I would, I would ask that, you know, where we have credits coming back, give us credit, you know, God. so we kind of keep a running total. Hey Jeff, we're, on up here. if you take a look at, at our report, this project is ahead of schedule and under budget. We're talking about okay. three. Unit uh, three, yes. Because, um, can you I know, just add something? That if, one, with regard to the unit three change orders, um, I, w I was asked to attend a meeting on Friday. I know Mr. Marcial is going to attend it with folks from Generation. Some of those change orders might be disputed. We're going to be going through that. So they're not necessarily all agreed change orders. Yep. Depending on what we find out, we'll report to the board as appropriate in open or closed session. I don't really know that there's a big issue we'll yet. Bring it back for information yeah, for and, the next meeting and in I the Valley. And I do know that, there's, that, that the project manager that's working on this project will also be discussing those same change orders next week. Very good. Okay. Is, that, is that okay with you, Director? Yeah, the, no, Thanks. The, we're bring talking about the external chain, uh, PMO project manager excuse me the external project yes. manager yes is, is he going to come in he's coming next week yes. I believe and he will be attending the meeting that mr. Marcial and I are attending okay. with other folks from generation on Friday on the same issue okay because there was one big one there that I think we probably ought to challenge okay all right cool so we'll put this on the agenda under information the next oh, meeting in the valley come up okay any test. other questions not um, we will oh, mr. Marcial, thank you very thank much you. now this is uh, Mr. Marcial, this document, uh, does it have to have board approval when it's finalized? No, ma'am. Just, just for, us, no, for in information. It's an SOP. It's based on your policy, but okay. it should be for right. information. Okay. Thank you so much. Moving on to page number 29, item number 5, deposition of surplus tangible prop personal property policy. Mr. Campbell, you yes. have five minutes. Uh, back on February 15th, uh, we presented a, an initial draft of uh, the the disposal of personal pro of, of property um, policy, and uh, the board gave direction to make some changes. Um, specifically, we um, incorporated the the CFO to uh, provide oversight regarding credit and trade-ins. Um, one of the points that I think was. Uh, uh, of, of concern was the uh, authority for how much uh, the general manager could identify. Um, originally, we had that consistent with signing authorities of 200,000, but uh, obviously that was uh, significantly higher than what I think people were, were um, expecting. We changed that to 50,000, and then subsequently we changed that uh, way down to $5,000 because um, the, I guess the model that we were thinking of is, you know, if the board has the authority to declare a vehicle surplus, um, relatively, that's about $5,000. So we just figured that an item of $5,000 or more should come back to the board for uh, approval as being uh, declared surplus. The, the challenge, again, is, um, and, and, and wherever the board wants to put the line, that's, that's fine with us, but but the consideration is, you know, if if every you know half spool of wire and you know 200 pounds of scrap metal, does the board really want every single thing to come back to the board? So we're trying to figure out where, where that line is that the uh, the board would find acceptable. Again, this is information and um, well, open for suggestions on you know what changes the board would like to see on this. Uh, Direct, uh, oh, director, ahead. well, director. Yeah, Hanks. I would I would ask uh, legal to to look at the uh, the water code. Uh, yeah, we did, and, um, and we, uh, I know Vance and first Vi and then Vance were involved. I believe this is consistent with the water code now. I, I, I think there were some issues with the old policy that's, that's being, re there was an original draft that came to you, which you said was not necessarily consistent. We agreed, and this is different. Okay, because I was, I was of the understanding that any prop property that's disposed of uh, should be declared surplus. Regardless of the dollar amount, and and that's what this policy. It, 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 there is an item. Uh, it, it, if you look at the um, section, th the on page thirty-two, the original resolu resolution that has been um, does. Dissolved because of the the we changed the, we created the policy for for purchasing therefore we rescinded the uh, the resolution. Um, th this was all that we had before, and uh, I, I think by creating a policy that grants that authority to the general manager 
to identify it is consistent with what we had before with the disposal of, of material equipment. But again, uh, looking at it from the water code standpoint, um, there was an expectation that the board declare uh, surplus specifically for, um, as we've identified in here, uh, real property, vehicles, heavy equipment. Uh, that, that is a responsibility of the board. That, that, again, the challenge is at what level does the general manager have authority to get rid of scrap stuff? And, and, and that is a challenge. So the policy would authorize the general manager to have that authority. Okay, I've, I've got a question I'd like to ask internal auditors. Uh, do, you, do you feel like uh, this is sufficient for you on and determine your inventory, keeping track of materials? Yeah, we don't have a problem with it. Okay, I just ask that you at legal take a look back because it's it's different the way I read it. No, I, I agree with you that the water code suggests that um, materials that are disposed of should be declared as surplus. The issue here is whether delegating the 5,000 or less um, is consistent with the law. I think it is, but I think it's up to the board. Um, I think the intent is clear, and I know Vance, if you, I know I looked at it and then I passed it on to Vance, and Vance helped them in the original drafting of this. This has kind of gone back and forth. There were some earlier versions that were a little bit different. But that's what Mr. Campbell's idea identifying as the issue is where do you want to draw the line on the delegation well, I think it it helps protect the employee that's oh I agree okay uh, director Sanchez did you have a comment no, I, I just had a comment I and I just like to see it um, whatever policies that need or the steps that need to be taken on the surplus or projects that we come under and all the surplus revenues instead of just I mean, of course, it goes back to the general fund, but I like to see it come back because sometimes we go, we want to do a project, and, and then the general manager say, "Well, we'll find the money," but we want to know whether it's coming from the surplus or is it coming from another project, and maybe have that decision be the board's decision, semi-annually or quarterly, what we do with the surplus money, whether buy down debt, um, give more to the communities, um, et cetera, et cetera, because technically that is money that was not, it was accounted to be spent, but it was actually saved. That's all. Yeah, it was it, it was my understanding that surplus material like this goes back to the general fund and the CFO has a right to redistribute it, but there has to be a record of it. It's, Greg, is that your understanding? or I think we're making him nervous. He's pacing back and forth. <laughs> no, no, you're correct. We, we account for that. And... Uh, uh, Actually, you know, recorded on our books as the revenue comes in. And if you abate it back, that's that's something. We, but you you would have a record then where. Yeah, we'll have a record of what was sold and what we received for what we did sell. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I and I agree that it goes back to the general fund, but uh, I just like to know if it was coming from surplus, and not necessarily just general fund, and if we could have the option of. Again, paying down debt, which I think everybody likes to do. Okay, any other questions? And uh, Director Hanks, are you comfortable with this? Do you want to make more adjustments? Do you want to come back for approval at the oh, next I, meeting? That's that's fine. I. Uh, Director Menil, are you comfortable like with it? Come good. Okay, bring it back at the next yep. board meeting then. Uh, any other comments? Good. Um, moving on to <laughs> item number six, page 33, uh, Energy Department General Matters. Uh, Dr. Koch. Madam President, uh, board members, uh, I have four quick things, uh, except nothing has been quick so far. Uh, the first, you all know that the Midway Bannister line is uh, being dedicated next week. Um, at the same time, in approximately uh, three weeks from now, we're finally going to dedicate the uh, Yucca uh, pipeline. Final work is being done. Um, that This has been uh, one of the biggest projects that I've ever worked on in terms of the number of co uh, counterparties, uh, people involved in this, nations involved. Uh, We've been spending an inordinate amount of time with the uh, Mexican customs. Uh, 
uh, the last couple of weeks. Um, and this is all due to the fact that the line had to swing south into Mexico to get around the Quezon Casino, where we'll be next week. Uh, but uh, with this, uh, or with the dedication, uh, currently Yucca is down. It'll be down for about 29, 30 days. When it comes back on, that's when we're going to dedicate it. It'll be TransCanada, APS, and ourself. <coughs> um, and we hope to start hedging the gas. We'll make approximately a $14 million gas purchase. Uh, effective around April 1st. This is approximately half the uh, gas that we'll be using um, for Yucca for the next year or two. This will result at current prices and an immediate $3 million per year reduction in our power supply costs. So we're moving forward with it. It's a little bit uh, if it starts, say, April 3rd, then we're going to have to play some games to get through balance a month for April. But we're looking forward to actually finishing this particular project and scheduling the gas for the first time from a interstate pipeline as opposed to SoCal's distribution system. Okay, so that handles that. Um, just to let the board know, uh, the Avenue 52, uh, Avenue 58 um, trans, uh, transformer, uh, the MWA was approved for that for $9.5 million, but part of this expense included um, uh, examination of the transformer, both in the pre-construction and post-construction testing. Uh, the transformer is being built in South Korea, so we're getting ready to send three employees over to South Korea to see the transformers is being uh, built, and then uh, when it's completed, to go, uh, go through all the testing with it. So the three that will be going are uh, Joe Lopez uh, from PMO, Fernando Gutierrez and uh, Juan Carlos Sandoval, and then when the project is completed, uh, when the transformer is completed for the uh, testing, it will be uh, Oscar Cabrini and uh, Carlos Cerrito going through. Now, the last thing, um, this week uh, we hope to tender the GIAs or the transmission service agreements for Path 42. Uh, we've talked to all uh, the participants. We did have one entity uh, drop out, one solar project drop out. We've already put that uh, transmission capacity available. Uh, up for uh, auction or in an open season. Now, Path 42 does not have an RA issue. Okay, That's never been part of the issue. It's only the transitional cluster that has an RA issue. But anything going out at Devers is not a problem, uh, at least from the generator's point of view. So all the capacity on that line has been spoken for. Uh, we are still having the same entity uh, requesting that we delay until July or August of this year. Uh, we've informed them uh, this morning that we're moving forward regardless of whether or not they want to participate. And should they choose not to participate, we have others willing to take their place. Um, uh, Director Menville, you had specific questions for me? Did you yeah, the question I had is on the, uh, you know, you're talking about the 1,300, 1,400 megawatts. Correct, sir. And, uh, you know, my question is, when is that going to come to fruition? Because you've got the dealing with eight-minute Cal Energy, so are we really sitting out there with 400 oh. or 500 megawatts, or what are we really out there that's in concrete? A as of today, on Path 42, which we have 780 megawatts of transmission capacity available. Uh, slightly over 700 of it has been um, agreed to, and Ms. Asbury is uh, setting the TSAs in place. So those would be tendered, and assuming, well, within about 35 to 40 days, we should be having the signing ceremony here for that first uh, portion of the upgrade. Okay, now this portion is only about 20, 25 million dollars, but the TSA transmission service agreement should be signed 
uh, I'll give myself a little bit more time in the next six weeks. Okay, so that'll go forward. Within the next 10 days, and again, we've re, uh, started at this point rejecting uh, requests for changes. Again, the same entity that we've been talking about today requested another major, major modification. Remember, they have transmission going up Path 42, and they also have transmission going out at IV under a different cluster. Uh, we've said that we're not going to look at any additional changes with them either on the, on the additional cluster also. Uh, those GIAs, which uh, we've revised the cost estimate down now to, I believe, about 190 million from the current 225, those should be going out in about uh, two, two and a half weeks. So given what's there, we should be seeing uh, signing ceremonies uh, about seven weeks from now about seven weeks from now. Uh, there is absolutely nothing that we can do if a particular participant takes advantage of our ODE and keeps trying to slow the project down. At this point, there's only one that's doing that. We have come to agreement with the other that you're talking about. Um, there's only one entity that is attempting to slow the process down and we've informed them that we're not waiting any longer for them. <coughs> Okay, the, the 190 million, is that the 700 megawatts you were talking about? That's correct, sir. That's the uh, second portion. That's the actual build out. It's not the Path 42 upgrades between, mid, uh, between Coachella Valley and Devers. It's the southern build out of our system. That's where the uh, customers, where the generators are going to interconnect. That's going to be the true cost, and that will. Uh, require the build out of Midway Bannister, uh, the High Line El Central Line, the Ivy Dixieland Line, the rebuild of the S Line. All those will be built under the roughly $190 million. So the first portion of it, the Path 42, only builds the KNKS Line between Coachella and Debers. Uh, and there is sufficient capacity to serve that. Well, when you have the signing in seven weeks for the 190 million, when would you have the 190 million in the bank? Uh, as soon as we sign. At the same time. Yes. For sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I'll hold you to that. I b believe me. We've been going for the generators. Uh, Mr. Garber did this week approve the form of the letters of credit that we're willing to accept at this point. Um, how the money has to be paid to us. So we're now getting down to the point where we're negotiating over the type of money, uh, type of uh, collateral, non-refundable, that they have to give to us uh, in the next few weeks. This is moving quickly. Um, we have actually had, uh, I'm not going to give you names right now, but we've had three solar contracts signed within, we're north of El Centro. Right, so, even the um, uh, purchasers are coming to the realization that this is uh, moving forward. In response to something that uh, Director Desert said, the, uh, we had another meeting yesterday with uh, the Cal ISO. Um, Mr. Keene felt that the uh, language was correct, but he was concerned about uh, some of the unspoken things that came up. Uh, but the language and the proposal that uh, the ISO has told us, they have not given us in writing yet as we expected. They're still flushing some things out. But what they have told us, and we believe negotiated, um, satisfies the RA issues for the generators. Is oh, that short term or long term? Long term. In the short term, we also have begun negotiations with one solar entity uh, for a transmission swap, whereby we deliver the energy to the to them at Palo Verde uh, from our our resources. So we schedule 100 megawatts at Palo Verde. They schedule here in the district. They schedule 10 megawatts here. We only schedule 90 megawatts to us at Palo Verde and send the other 10 megawatts off to somebody else. That negotiations has begun. Okay. Um, Director Sanchez? Mr. Clark, I can't remember. Um, 
now we 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 have a new out and I, we believe some <coughs> mo we one entity is now satisfied have we i'm not sure if you've discussed with us have we found the the way that we're going to pay back that line when it's not in use because the sun only chi shines during specific times yes sir as far as the uh, debt service well if it stands right now okay like can i if it stands today uh we could take a line uh, let's uh, let, let's stay with midway banister that costs 25 million dollars they're going to give us this 25 million dollars we will now build the line uh how will we how will we pay them back under our current tariff um they would be paying a dollar ninety per kw month for the right to use this line even though they've paid for it it's our line it's not their line uh, so we now are trying to make sure exactly how much of that dollar ninety is used for <laughs> o and m right. so we're not going to put the rate payer at risk even for the o and m so maybe it's 10 cents a kw a month we'll pull that 10 cents out and then they would get a credit for a dollar 80 uh against the 25 million dollars that they put up okay so that's the basic model what the solar generators have argued for is wait a sec uh i'm not using the line that much as you point out and the cost is prohibitive to us it's 10 or 12 dollars a megawatt hour if we have to pay for this line under the current tariff. So um, Mr. Broking has begun a rate study working with back and internal people that we're going to split that into a, uh, we're going to propose splitting that into a fixed charge, an energy charge, that instead of paying back the generator over nine or 10 years, we may pay back low capacity factor resources over 15 or 20 depending upon what the ultimate uh, recommendation is so that the uh, generator recovers his money but instead of paying the equivalent of $12 a megawatt hour may pay four or five dollars that may seem like a lot when it's pancaked on top of the ISO rates but the ISO rate now is uh, 660 as of Monday compared to our roughly uh, 225 it's just unfortunately it's pancaked mm -hmm. the two rates on top of each other so thank you it's a good question okay any other comments no yeah the the uh, 10 million that, that we've asked the developers put up refresh my memory what was that for uh that's for the first phase of the uh, project we are uh, have the environmental review the right-of-way acquisition and the um, preparation of bids so that we know what the final uh, cost is we're estimating through our through our process that's about 190 million dollars should the cost like, I'm going to use 200 for simplicity um, if the cost is greater than 240 million under 20 percent above the estimate then all the generators would have the opportunity to, to walk away from the project. Uh, we'd still do what we did on Path 42, but the generators would not, they do not want to be uh, committed to an open checkbook and what some of them are concerned about, uh, uh, IIDs, um, they, they want to make sure that IID can build it within a 20% band of what we estimated. Okay, so that we're not providing a low ball estimate and then turning around and saying, hey, guess what? We told you 200, it's 400, please give us another uh, 25 or $30 million. So they have that out. But the $10 million is to begin the environmental work. Now we have already started to avoid um, missing this year's uh, biological diversity and uh, population survey we've already uh, started a hundred eighty thousand dollar contract to move forward with that so that we can meet the december 31st 2013 date if we miss that then everything would be pushed back a year 
So we, we are in, a, in effect fronting that money and then we'll get it paid back from the uh, developers when it comes through. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, these these uh, solar companies that signing up, do they have I, I can tell days? you, uh, uh, yes, that's that's what is actually, I'll tell you after the board meeting, they, they are on the PUC approval apparently for this week, and I'll tell you who, uh, who they are, although I'm sure you can guess. Okay. And other than waiting for that six week or seven week window for the signature, is is there another date and a nearer future, a nearer date to where we're at today that we Wait, should? Look we cannot. To? By, by tariff, mm -hmm. we tender the GIAs and TSA. So this week we're sending out the transmission service agreements. We then have to give them a minimum of thirty calendar day, of thirty calendar days before we can request. Uh, tell them that the uh, sign and then they have 10 days to give us the check at that point although when the signing ceremony comes uh well we'll expect them to have at least symbolic 10 checks. calendar days or just 10 days uh, it's days? 30 calendar days for the uh waiting period i'm going to assume it's 10 calendar days uh I'm not 100% sure. That's not that. important. And with that one generator dropping out, and that's a significant portion, we have, we've made that up with other projects? Yes. We were on path 42, we were oversubscribed. That was done through an open season, which rather than a customer requesting it, we just say, we're going to build this line, who wants it? Uh, it actually made life a whole lot easier for us when that uh, generator, and it's a generator that was here in the early two, uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2001, 2, 3, 4, but had a request in and never dropped it. So we were not unhappy to see that uh, generator go. And could you quickly give us the, the, the how, how did uh, Cal ISO make the correction to the RA issue within their Well, the RA purview? issue... It, the RA issue deals with deliverability. Where does energy go? Right. Pa uh, the KNKS line is a radio line from Devers into our service territory. So if all the other transmission lines go down, the only place for the power to go is up the KNKS line to Devers. So there's never been an RA issue with Path 42. The RA issue deals with the, tra uh, the transitional cluster updates upgrades to IV uh, sub well to both IV sub and to um, Debers well we have a thousand megawatt peak we're building 1200 or 1300 megawatts of new generation on top of the generation that's here within the district uh, there there is no way for the district not to export power with the, with the generation that will be built as a result of this we will be a net energy exporter and the only place for that power to go is to the ISO so that is how the deliverability issue is being solved which means the RA will be there okay so the resource adequacy capacity uh, is a function of where does the power flow of transmission lines are cut since they flow to the ISO and the ISO agrees that uh, it's going to be resolved. So do we need to be building up a history on the IV sub for, for RA issues? We, we have been. We have been. Um, we actually had a test of it a few, oh, 10 weeks ago, 12 weeks ago, Don't somewhere in there, but time just kind of disappears when you go back two days from now. Um, we did see that we could actually force power out of IV into the ISO system. I think we moved 200 megawatts just to show that we could do it. Okay, any other comments, uh, Director Hanks? Yeah, now the 780 that's, that's available on the upgrade, is that correct? That's on the path 42, yes path sir. Path 42. But we have an additional 200 through the IV sub currently? Um, we, we, well, the total amount of capacity that we would be exporting will be about 1,250 megawatts. Uh, so some of it will be going through Devers, some of it will be going through IV, uh, and some of it will be going through Blythe, which is very limited, but that's where uh, energy source is sending their energy. 
Well, on that ten million that on that first phase, uh, is that being held back? That work being held back currently, or is, are we moving forward with it? Um, we're doing as much as we can without spending extreme amounts of money. Uh, we'll have we will be bringing on March twenty second the uh, owner's engineer contract for information so that we can also have that available to sign and start spending money the day that we get dollars from the uh, uh, generators, the $10 million. There is, as long as we have the biological survey work being done, at this point our schedule is not being affected. Uh, if this were not signed in the next six to ten weeks, I would start having heartburn and bad things would happen uh, in terms of meeting the 2013 deadline. Well, that's that's what I was reason I was asking. I I would sure hate for for there to be a holdback because now we're talking about their tax credits being affected. That's correct. That the and the value of this and this is why. <clears throat> that this is why so many of the other generators would like very much for this holdout to make a decision and go forward. And they've held us back now for 10 weeks. Um, at this point, we're going forward, and we are on schedule uh, to meet the deadline. Uh, I'd like to, if, if it's possible, uh, Mr. Carver, I'd like to see the board uh, give uh, some type of direction or something to the general manager to keep this moving forward. Yes, we can give any direction. The board can give any direction they want. Well, he's from what you're saying and what you reported here today. Uh, you're moving forward, but there could be some hiccups. I, I don't believe so, based upon our discussion this morning. I think we will lose the generator. I don't know that for sure. They're going to have to make some very strategic decisions. Uh, but based upon what he said this morning, um, well, I, 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 I don't me, know which way. Let me ask. Going to go I got to ask a question of uh, uh, Mr. Kelly on this. I know you've been in these negotiations involved in this, you and I talked about this the other day, but I mean, this this thing is pretty much going along the way you feel this thing needs to be moving along, right? To protect the board. And well, that, uh, I, these, because my worry is, that's the reason I ask you these questions, there's all this hype out there about doing all these megawatts, but you've got people trying to not play ball, and it's holding back the guys, uh, 700 megawatts or so, that want to play ball with us. He is doing what that company is doing, what is best for that company. I understand, but that it's may not, not be best for, me. for us. <laughs> it's not good for us. And but I'm not going to keep sitting here as one board member and being held hostage when you've got other people that want to put up money and want to move forward. Because in the end, we, the board, are going to get blamed for not getting these things done. And that's my concern. Well, that uh, actually, um, that that's a concern that I have. Um, I, I think that uh, Dr. Koch is right to move forward with the biological survey because that window would close and we'd be we'd be behind. Um, uh, I am concerned about um, uh, losing uh, such a major part of the cluster, um, and and I think that that probably the board. Um, uh, needs a little more information on that before uh, you know you sort of close that door on the resource adequacy um, you, know, you asked about short term versus uh, a lasting um, solution um, uh, dr. Koch when will we know um, that this administrative approach worked uh, I Mr. Keene told me that it would take about 35 days from the time that the district and the ISO agreed on the language. What's interesting is the district and the ISO are agreeing on language that affects generators, uh, that the generators may not like the language. Um, I don't think so, because we're only looking out for the generators here, but the negotiations are between us and the ISO. Um, we're protecting the interests of the generators. The generators are doing their own lobbying. 
Um, well, our, about 35 days. Our, our, uh, uh, is the district's um, uh, interest and the, the uh, generator's interest uh, they're, they're constant? They're and constant, yes, sir. Okay. We, we have no interest in the RA except to the extent that uh, we want to see the issue solved so that the generators can start so, uh, right. signing contracts. Right. I, I do think that the board um, in, in the next, as it is on water, I think it may want to um, uh, uh, take this up separately with uh, Dr. Koch in a, um, in a more focused way. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Now, let me. Let me walk back through and see if I got this correct. Okay, the, the uh, 700 or so megawatts would, would go up through Devers with an upgrade. Uh, there's not an issue there of an RA factor. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, when it gets to Devers, there's, we're not building a bridge to nowhere. There's going to be... <coughs> are these generators going to be able to move their power? That, that is been... Well, first, is there capacity with Edison's current announced uh, upgrades? Uh, we think the district, myself, feels that there's about 550 to 650 megawatts of capacity. Um, the ISO thinks that there's more capacity. <clears throat> they have said if we get the... Uh, proof to them that we are signing contracts, they will go forward with additional upgrades at uh, West of Devers. But under the ISO model, uh, there's always capacity. This, they have a congestion charge that says if there's 1,000 megawatts coming into a point and there's only 800 megawatts coming out, somebody has to pay for that 800. How much do you want to start lowering your price? And the most expensive 200 don't get dispatched. Uh, that's not what all the generators want to hear. They want to hear that there's a thousand megawatts coming in and a thousand megawatts going out. That's not the way the ISO works. But if we can show, uh, even though the ISO is asking us to do something that's not in their tariff, that we have signed contracts, generation interconnection agreements, that they will expand uh, the Path 42. That is what we talked about when um, uh, President Mendoza and yourself and Mr. Kelly went to Sacramento about. Show us that we have uh, generation interconnection agreements by May and then we will uh, allocate the funds to upgrade path uh, the west of Devers issues. And that's just an administrative decision on their part. There's not per It's less than $50 million. It's an administrative decision. Okay. Uh, their, their signature authority is bigger than mine. All right. Now, if, uh, if we collect 190 to what, 240 million, whatever, from these generators, and we're not prepared on this first phase with all this EIR review and everything. And they put the money up, and then they lose their tax credit. And we're saying it's non-refundable. That's why I'm asking this board to give authorization for you to keep moving. I would appreciate that. I think it's, a, it's only wise on our part. We're going we're gonna to collect 190, 200 million from these people. We better be ready to run with them. I, the MWA is ready to go forward, but I don't want to bring the MWA without a funding source, as you've just heard, Mr. Um, as Angel just pointed out. Mr. Kelly? Yeah, Mr. Comments? Garber uh, just suggested to me, and I, I think it makes sense, that uh, perhaps we ought to present the board with some sort of an, an action item uh, in which you could formalize this. At this, the next meeting? Uh, At yes. Next week, yeah. on Tuesday? Well, well with the, the purpose of, of hastening this, this process and, and, uh, okay. and uh, operating on an expeditious schedule. That would be good. Right. Um, yeah, because we're not just talking about to the 190 they're putting up. We're also talking tomorrow. about uh, their investors. 
Pardon it, me, I, Dr. Koch? I'd have to have the board agenda pre finished by noon tomorrow. I'm not 100. The MWA is ready, but I'm not sure that I can move it by 12 o'clock. This wouldn't tomorrow. be the MWA. This would be a separate item just to reflect the sentiment of the board to, to okay. move I can do forward. That. Okay. And I can, we can do unleash okay. the hounds and right. get them that's moving. What, very that's good. what the board seems to be saying they want to do. Did, want to say something? Mm -hmm. I appreciate okay. that, Director. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, Dr. Cope. Uh, next on the agenda is um, Ms. Barber on uh, update on Senate Bill 1 program, photovoltaic taken solutions. Um, I know you have a rather lengthy presentation. I'm going to ask you to streamline that as much as you can. I will certainly do that. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, President Mendoza and members of the board. Um, my name is Sabrina Barber. I'm the Assistant Manager of the Energy Management and Strategic uh, Marketing Unit. I'm here to give you an update on our SB1 program, um, PV Solutions. Um, in this presentation, I want to quickly highlight um, program changes that were implemented in 2011. I'd also like to review the rollover incentive mounts from previous years, as well as give an overview of the um, applications that were submitted in uh, 2011 are plans for allocating rollover funding. Um, this next chart is just a utility comparison. I wanted to give you kind of a perspective of where we compare to other POUs and um, irrigation districts, but we'll go ahead and skip that uh, for tonight. Um, I do want to note that uh, 2010 figures, um, those are actually reported um, in late April of this year. So that's why they're not reflected on that chart. Um, the various, uh, we made various changes to the 2011 program in order to comply with the state guidelines. Um, one of the uh, significant changes that were implemented this year was performance-based incentives for, uh, the, this PBI is based on the actual generation of uh, the solar energy system installed and it's paid out annually over a five-year period. Um, for 2011, the PBI rate was 24 cents per kilowatt hour, and PBI was required for all systems um, 30 kilowatt uh, and higher, and any um, other technologies which would be considered anything other than flat panel PV. Um, incentive cap for this year was $650,000 for the five-year period, which um, resulted in a cap for the payout, uh, payout of the rebate at $130,000 a year. We also required the implementation and use of a PV Watts version two. That's a modeling tool. Um, customers needed to use this in order to estimate uh, the actual performance of their system that they plan to install. Um, there's no cost to the customer, and we provided the link um, for them on our website. And we also required electrical system sizing documentation. Um, SB1 requires that any installation is intended to offset part or all of the host customer's electrical needs. Um, and it needed to be limited to um, no more than the 12-month total energy usage from the prior year. So we were able to provide that information for those that did, did not already have that. Um, and the uh, systems were based on that amount. For any systems that had less than the five-month billing period, we did require future load calculations. And essentially, that's just a list of the appliances, the kilowatt hours, t um, multiplied by the total hours of, that they intended to use it to come up with the um, load calculation. We also implemented um, energy efficiency requirements. All of these um, requirements must be met in order to qualify for the program. Uh, for retrofits, there was an energy efficiency audit that was required for all customers. For new, constructed, new construction, we required a copy um, of the building permit or building permit information, the Title 24 report, and we needed to see that they, um, there was at least a 15% reduction in the building compared to the Title 24, so their energy efficiency needed to um, exceed Title 24 by the 15 percent. We also required for all customers, not um, commercial, industrial, residential, or the municipalities, they needed to submit an energy efficiency dis disclosure agreement. And essentially what that does is just spells out each component of the energy efficiency requirements, and they're required to initial each uh, component and also sign overall, um, verifying that they have read it and understood the requirements. Um, we added it to our guidelines because it was not included before. The concentrated PV, this is the other technologies, anything other than the flat panel PV. And we require that they submit along with that um, 
these other technologies have not completed their state testing. So um, in order to qualify for the program, they have to submit a copy of their Sandia National Laboratories or SRCC test report um, that provides the performance uh, summary. And they also needed to submit a copy of the production estimate models, inputs, and results. Um, we also required this year, which is um, new, since we're working in close coordination with our customer operations as a distribution planning um, and engineering folks, we required that uh, the one-line diagram that's submitted must be uh, approved by the local jurisdiction having authority and also be stamped by a professional engineer. Another change for the 2011 program is we required a um, PMRS and a PDP, uh, if applicable. Uh, that's a performance monitoring reporting service, which is essentially um, equipment that reports the performance on a 15-minute interval. And the uh, PDP is a third party um, that provides PMRS reporting information. So it just conveys that uh, performance data back to um, the IID. The PMRS is something that is approved by the state, whereas IID can approve um, the PDP. And the PMRS and the PDP can be the same thing, but a PDP cannot be a PMRS. It's like really confusing. but. Um, I want to go over the um, rollover incentive amounts for uh, IIDs required as part of SB1 to pay out. We have a, an annual budget through 2016 of a little over $4 million that must be paid out. Um, this amount um, reduces, well not this amount, but the incentives reduce 7% every year through um, 2016. In 2008, we paid out um, a little over $1.4 million. So we rolled over 2.6 um, to the following year. In 2009, we paid out 3.6 million. Um, so we had a rollover amount of 419, although we do have pending payment of $141 or $1,000. So a little over 300,000 rolled over to the 2010 year. Um, in 2010, we paid out a little over 1.6 million um, with a rollover of 2.3, um, but we do have pending payments from that year of 3.8 thousand, which um, was an overage from in 2010. However, with the funds that we had available from 2008 and 2009, we still have a surplus of $1.3 million that needs to be distributed. This is just a quick summary of the applications that we had for 2008 through 2011. Um, this year you'll see that we had 148 residential applications. That's substantially higher than we've uh, seen during any of the other years. Um, commercial also increased to 21, although not as significantly as residential. And uh, governmental came in at 61. For this year, we approved 41 of those applications. There were 40 that were, re were rejected. Um, and there were 94 applications that were not uh, funded. I've also listed the reasons for the rejection. There were two that did not meet the energy efficiency requirements for Title 24. Um, 31 of the applications had the owner's signature missing. That's one of the requirements. We have to have the actual contract account owner sign the applications. It can't be um, anyone else. Um, one application had the uh, signature missing period, one was oversized, three did not use the, the calculator, one submitted an old form which didn't have all the information that we need for the 2011 program year, and then one, um, one customer attempted to uh, submit multiple applications, so that one was also rejected. Um, well, what I want to discuss now is how we plan on intended, er, uh, applying the rollover funding. Um, we want to roll over the 2010 into our 2011 residential applications. Um, we'll carry over that $1.3 million, um, which incre increases our 2011 budget to um, approximately $5.4 million. We estimate that this would um, support over 500 kilowatt um, systems, which would equate to approximately 72 of the 94 pending applications or not funded applications from uh, this year. And we, uh, again, intend to apply all available the funding to the residential applications. 
With all the changes that we made for the 2011 program year, um, we really anticipated that we would see slower um, enrollment. Historically, our uh, commercial or our non-residential, I guess I should say, funding ran out within um, two to three days, and residential typically lasted, you know, uh, up to two weeks. This year, we ran out. Our program was fully subscribed within the first two days. Um, our 2011 pro process was essentially the same as last year as far as the acceptance of the applications. It was on a first come, first serve basis. Um, we required that the application met the guidelines for the um, established for the 2011 program and required that all reservation documents uh, must be submitted. Um, the program this year was incredibly popular. I mean, it's always been um, one of our most successful programs, but this year we had you know a large number of uh, customers camping out at both facilities. Um, you know, you've heard today on some of the customer comments, I had a long discussion. I mean, we had several, several customers that were quite angry, most of them just complaining and calling Andy and I dirty names, but um, I did have really good suggestions and feedback. Um, so we wanted to you know take that into consideration and there was concerns over the two locations um, concerns that our application process is too cumbersome and confusing um, we were available during uh, the end of November and also the whole month of December to assist customers with um, the 2011 op application we also provided workshops and posted that information on the websites where we ran newspaper ads and um, we actually had a couple we submitted the information to the radio spots for public information I believe only one of them KXO actually read, um, announced the workshops but um, there was also the concern over the contractors issue um, that has not appeared in prior program years to be of significant significance but um, this year it had a definite impact on our on our program so here's um, our proposal for the 2012 program um, I think it's important to convey both to the board and to our ratepayers that you know we're listening and we're receptive to any suggestions that will help us improve our program um, so for 2012, um, we'll be re reducing the maximum incentive to $550,000. We're uh, planning on implementing a 40-10-50 split um, for a one-week application period. And what this essentially means is 40% of the funding for the first three uh, will be allocated specifically for residential. We'll take the first three days um, to accept uh, those applications. If that funding runs out prior to the first three days, um, we'll just hold off on the fourth day of that week. Um, we're going to be allocating 10% of the funding to uh, governments and nonprofits, the public entities. Um, and if for some reason in the first three days there's actually some funds available after the residential um, applications are done, we'll roll that over to the next class, which would be governmental. Um, if it's fully utilized, then we'll just move on to the 10% funding for the uh, fourth day. And then on the fifth day, um, we're going to split 50% of the um, total allocation just for commercial. If there happens to be funding available from the four, four prior days, we'll also roll that over into the fifth day. Um, and that explains the leftover funding. Um, one other change that we'll do, the uh, applications, since we are accepting in both La Quinta and um, the Imperial or El Centro facilities, um, we'll be utilizing electronic time date stamp that will have you know the hours, the minutes, the seconds, so that will avoid any potential uh, conflict that we have on whether applications, which ones were submitted first. Okay. Now what, what, what this does I have a question for you. Sure. I have a question. Yeah, go on. What are you going to do about where one guy is sitting there with 30 applications? And that's what I was going to mention right here. Um, what I've proposed here doesn't address the uh, contractor issue typically, and you'll see this in the next um, presentation, and you'll see what I mean. Um, we like to see the contractors really drive these programs. Um, they do a lot of the marketing for us. With this particular program, it's not necessary because it is so popular. 
So um, we felt it was important to go ahead and you know raise this decision to the board and get your feedback on how it should be implemented. There's essentially three ways we can um, handle it. We can do nothing and allow them to continue to submit the way that they are. I mean, they're mark aggressively marketing this program. They're going out, they're finding the contractors or the customers, helping them with their application, and essentially saying, if you receive um, incentive funding, then we'll move forward. If not, you know, this goes away. So you're not contracting actually obligated to um, install this system if you don't get the rebate incentives. Um, or we could make all of the customers that we have a contract account with, they have to submit their own applications. I think that we would probably get a lot of um, resistance to that idea. I know myself, typically, if I go to a contractor and I'm having them do work for me, I don't want to have to go out and do um, any of the paperwork or the submittal, I typically want them to take care of it. That's what I pay them for. So I don't know if we would necessarily want to go that way, but that's obviously another option that we could uh, proceed with. Or um, one of the suggestions that was given was that we go ahead and allow the contractors to submit them on behalf of the customers, but um, once they come in, they can only submit one application at a time and then go back to the end of the line because we do have you know, 15 to 20 people standing there um, waiting to submit their applications. So um, they can continue to go back in the line every time, but at least it's only one per um, slot, and then they'll have to go back, and that gives the next person who's also waiting an opportunity. Because we did have two situations where um, we had one contractor come in with 31 applications, and then we had another contractor come in with 37 applications. So it does, particularly with the residential, it can you know, eat up those funds Quite yeah. Th that makes quickly. sense if they can come in with one application and then process that and then go back and get go to the line. back of the line. I think that's a fair thing. Uh, well, um, should I don't know if we can be able to do this. I could probably answer in a couple next couple of days, but because of an, of an applicant who's currently buying a new home comes and puts his or her name down, escrow doesn't close till two or three months. But if the buyer decides not to buy it. But the, the contractor is going to have the contract for the uh, panel already. Maybe funds should not be dispersed until after close of escrow. Well, and they're not, they're not, essentially when they submit the application, it's just requesting a reservation amount. Um, they still have to submit all their documentation. They still have to meet um, milestones in order before they receive any incentive amount. So um, since the application needs to be in the customer's name as well as the the contractor i'm not sure that that would necessarily be an issue the application and the approval is conditioned on closing of escrow and oh, okay. all these other things happening oh. right well i mean i think it would i don't know i mean just one that uh, a one one guy comes in and snatches up the 70 you know when i think other people average joe who, who wants to maybe it's going to have to panel. go back and get in line. Well, as far as developers, we actually, in the 2010 program year, we, because um, they were allowed to submit applications prior to 2010, and that was actually eliminated in the 2010, um, because we did have two projects for the 2010 year um, that, or was it 2009? 2009. 2009, that um, the developers ate up all the funds. What, what kind of program? I know that... Um, Director Hanks talked about it, or I can't remember who talked about it, about the, um, on, develop, on a development, maybe put a small solar site that, com that, uh, uni that could go under commercial, maybe that, uh, that uh, community solar farm kind of a thing. Uh, director, we're going out, uh, the bid documents for that have been prepared, they're over at uh, um, purchasing now. We're going out for 35 megawatts of solar, uh, 10 megawatts in the Coachella Valley, 10 megawatts in El Centro, and then the other 15 megawatts spread out in one and two uh, megawatt blocks throughout uh, our entire service territory, and we'll make that available for community solar. Is, that, is there something available, or is that too small for like a small subdivision? 
Oh no! If they um, want to dedicate an acre to uh, solar one, or half one an acre. acre, well, if they did that, then small panels. Not obviously not the big ones. <laughs> well, yes, but you're you're talking that would be about 200 kW. Generally, it's about five acres per megawatt, five to seven acres per megawatt. So, if a community wanted to dedicate one acre, they would get about 200 kW, which would satisfy. Uh, yeah, because they say one megawatt service is about 700 homes, and you don't have seven. Well, some, this would some be planned communities 70, have 700 homes. But this would be this would satisfy about 50 to 70 homes, uh, typically. So, yes, we we are pushing the community solar process going forward. Uh, do you I got, uh, Sabrina on the on the 31 and the 37 applications that the two people had mm -hmm. were those did those all stick were they all good applications um, no actually one uh, that's one of the rejections that was in here um, and 31 of them were uh, uh, one was approved and 31 were denied the other 37 yes they did get in didn't they the, yeah, the, the Kishon yeah. um, okay and I, and I know I'm on getting back in line again because I know the contractors people get them they go out and bring the business in mm -hmm. You know, to me, if a guy had a one time and then go back the back of the line and come again, if he had 30, you know, maybe you'd look at five. Right. And then he has to go back of the line and come forward again. But, I mean, that does need to look at. I know the gentleman that was here mm -hmm. and spoke at the public uh, session about having to stand in line. I mean, that it, that is a concern when a guy just takes everything right in front of you. You also paid somebody to stand in line, too, the contract. <laughs> I heard somebody to stand in line and come in all night to be, to be first in line for three days. For three days, and you know, yeah, they, they, oh, they camped they out. They were camped there out. <laughs> that's that's not. Yeah. No. There has to be a, a more a, a better way of doing this. That's more, that's fair to the residents. Money. Yeah. Well, I know. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Not. Yeah, Sabrina. How how do we get more? Do you have any idea how to get more traction for people in Imperial County? To put solar um, panels? <laughs> We're, I think it's just education and awareness. And of course, um, when you look at the um, economics of it, you know, the, the Imperial County residents aren't necessarily um, in the same economic position that our Riverside County, um, some of them are here. Right. And quite honestly, Riverside County is much more green-minded than Imperial County. But we're we're trying to do that through um, education and awareness. We're really going to try to promote um, Earth Day and just trying to get people more familiar with um, how many you know, renewables. How many did how many in Imperial County were installed through our funds? Do you remember the split? Uh, installed so far. Or Residential. I would only say about ten percent of all of them. Residential. Yeah, the majority of all of our PV funds over the entire um, program, uh, 2008 through 2011, has been spent in Riverside County. How much? The majority of it. Majority At least 90 percent, yeah. Well, we are seeing more in the Imperial Valley right now. Do we have do we have a certain do we have a certain percentage where when we start the first two three days let's say sixty percent in Riverside because it's much larger uh, per capita and thirty five forty percent in Imperial County and then we keep that in Imperial County for two three days four days see if we can get some interest and then after a certain time then we bring it back to um, Riverside County. We have not done that historically. Um, as I mentioned, most of the interest has been here. Right. I don't know that we would necessarily get 40 percent. Right. No, I don't. County. I don't think so either. But maybe there's an opportunity once the ball starts rolling. Sure. Maybe sure. people Absolutely. can say, you know, I want that to keep up with the Joneses, so to speak. Right. And we can consider that for future years. And just to make one quick comment on your developer uh, concern, if I remember correctly, I want to say it's SB1, but there is some legislation that is requiring either with 2011 or 2012 um, that the de developers have essentially their own, depending on the number of. Uh, units that they have in their track that they develop renewable for that so whether it's off-site or on the houses they have an option but either way that they need to um, offset their you know carbon footprint for those particular facilities it is SB1 isn't it yes okay. any other comments if not we'll move on to your second item uh, energy efficient and public program update again please go very quickly sure um, 
As all of you are aware, IID is not regulated by the CPUC or the CEC, but we're still required to um, meet legislative mandates. The Energy Management and Strategic Marketing Section is responsible for the administration of public programs that are established by this legislation. Um, most of you, if not all of you, are already familiar. You've seen this legislation. AB 1890 is the um, law that implemented the public benefits charge. It's a 2.85% that funds these public benefit programs. SB 1037 um, required the reporting to the CEC on an annual basis. AB 2021 um, required development of targets as well as evaluation, measurement, and verification. Um, AB 32 established the comprehensive program to reduce our greenhouse gases, the energy efficiency and demand side management programs help IID attain these goals. And um, obviously the SB1 uh, that we just <coughs> talked about, our PV solutions program. Um, I'd like to quickly share some of the 2010 successes. Um, the first one is one of a series of upgrades that were planned for implementation at IID-owned facilities, and that is uh, the lighting retrofit of the La Quinta headquarters, both our admin and operations uh, facilities. You can see these um, lights here. We uh, retained a, um, a local vendor, uh, American Lighting, to install 830 803 lights. They replaced um, incandescents and T12s with T5s, T8s, and efficient wall packs, as well as installed occupancy sensors. We estimate the annual energy savings to be over 450,000 kilowatt hours per year, um, with an estimated annual cost savings of a little over 60,000 a year, so we saw a simple payback of two years. Next, we had our very first Energy Rewards double rebate campaign. Um, we saw the largest savings come from lighting and windows. Um, the regular rebate period, we saw an average of 263 rebates uh, applications paid out um, per month. During the double rebate, that increased to 558 per month. Um, the majority of the increase came, as I indicated, in lighting and the windows, and that was primarily because of that contractor involvement that I mentioned. I mean, we had a lot of uh, contractors that were very aggressive in uh, finding potential applicants, um, filling out their application forms for them, marketing the program on our behalf, um, <coughs> and making sure that those uh, programs were implemented. Um, we also had a Wattwise Wednesday CFL exchange. We previously conducted bulb giveaways at fairs, but nothing to this magnitude. We had eight events total, four in each county. And we had a total, uh, well, we advertised these particular events in the newspapers through bill inserts and also asked the cities to uh, notify their customers through their no newsletters. Yes. Um, and those what, these uh, light bulbs give away, you had them in the Imperial Valley. In what cities were they? We had them in El Centro, in Brawley, Calexico. The Bear. <coughs> yeah, I believe we had two in El Centro at the division office. It was commented to me that perhaps when you do this, do you plan to do this again? We'll probably do that again this year, 2012. We won't just because there's a phasing out of the um, incandescence anyway, so it pretty much because saturates Because I was the told market. that in, in the north end, like Calipat, mm -hmm. Westmoreland, Nyland, they didn't really get a chance to participate as much because we didn't really service that area. And this concern north was end. also brought up at the ECAC and, yeah. meeting last night. So um, we'll certainly take that into consideration for future you events. Do it again. All right. Um, uh, as I indicated, we had 724 total participants, and we distributed thir over 3,500 bulbs. Um, we estimate the net, net annual savings at 101,000 kilowatt hours annually, uh, with a cost savings of approximately 13,000 uh, annually for our customers. Which, um, you know, obviously 13,000 doesn't necessarily seem like a lot of money, but this program was extremely popular with our residential customers. We got a lot of um, positive feedback and really garnered some customer satisfaction. So. Um, we continued our efforts through Public Power Week. In addition to the proclamation that we do, we also distributed CFLs at the division office. Um, essentially, any customer that came in during the Public Power Week that paid their a bill um, in one of the division offices, we d gave them a CFL as customer appreciation. And we also continued our community involvement. In addition to these um, major events that you see identified here, we also attended various smaller venues, such as the Sealy Festival, the um, La Quinta Market Days, the Hopewell Carrot uh, Festival. We also had our inaugural Earth Day of It's Our World. That's our slogan. Um, it was a 
last year's was a joint effort with the County of Imperial and also San Diego Gas and Electric. This year we're planning a much larger event which um, satisfies some of the requirements that we have for education and awareness. And um, the education and warm awareness component is really important because that's what we find really changes co consumer behavior long term, whereas some of these um, financial incentives just tend to be short term. Um, with that being said, I'd also like to extend an invitation to every one of you um, to our 2011 event. It'll be held at Imperial Valley College on April 16th from 10 to 3. And we'll have all kinds of activities, um, and it's open to, I'm sorry? Yeah, we'll have some demonstrations and events for the family. Um, another 2010 success was um, the section operated within the budget. Um, the funding that you see here is something that had not uh, previously been done for um, the energy efficiency and public benefits section. There wasn't an established budget. So um, 2010 for the energy efficiency and de demand side management program portion, there for the 2010 allocation was a little, almost $6.3 million. Our actual expenditures came in at six, uh, approximately $6 million. And that included all the incentives that were paid out, our program administration costs, as well, well as our contracted service. What is your budget for service. 2011? Uh, 2011 is, it's, yeah, 6.6. .6. It's just about the same. The overall budget is the, a little over 12 million, but um, you have to keep in mind that about half of that goes to uh, our low-income assistance programs and also our All right. medical. You have quite a few pages left. Could we yeah, just kind I'm of skip to going the, through here? <laughs> just uh, you don't have to go through every single one. Just kind of highlight the ones that are. Okay. Um, so just because so we can read this at our leisure. Okay. Um, so IID like first pages. adopted our annual program targets in 2007. Um, since then, those targets have been revised. We have to do the, the revision based um, on AB 2021. It requires that we uh, review and revise as appropriate on a triennial basis. Um, so we'll be bringing that, uh, the a resolution back to you for approval. Our next slide uh, kind of gives you an idea. Here's where you can see the impact of the different le legislation. In 2006-2007, uh, SB 1037 was implemented that required our programs. In 2008 through 2010, you see where AB 2021 was implemented that required our um, targets. Uh, 2008 appears to be an anomaly. Um, we haven't gone back and verified this savings because at that time, uh, the measurement and verification was not required. However, we are doing that for 2009. Um, Although you know we're satisfied with our savings last year, despite the restructuring of the section, we were still able to increase our energy savings um, above the prior year. But as you can see here, um, it's not enough. We need to do significantly more in order to meet our targets. Um, the next slide is just a utility comparison to give you a, an idea of um, where we and fall we can with read some that of the other. Yeah, just, this one's fine. Okay. Um, here is our revised uh, program targets for 20. 11 through 2020, and these will bring back for, for a resolution for your okay. review and approval. Um, this one just gives you an idea of what our projected savings are for 2011. Um, our goal for 2011, based on the revised targets, is um, approximately 20,000 megawatt hours. Um, based on our projected savings, will exceed that. Um, we should come in at about 30,000 megawatt hours. And the open for business, vending miser, swimming and savings, AC upgrades, and community solar, those are all new programs that will be implemented in 2011. And we did bring back some of the existing programs. I won't go through these. Um, we've had these uh, from our 2010 years, and we're just continuing them on. Okay. Um, our 2011 program mix, here's a couple of our new programs that we'll be implementing in 2000, uh, the second quarter 2011. We have a small commercial direct install program that's currently out for um, rebid, as is a community lighting. On our uh, direct install program, we had two vendors that submitted uh, proposals based on our original solicitation. However, um, one was local and one was not, and our uh, local vendor ended up not participating in the uh, mandatory pre-bid meeting, so they were disqualified. And in an effort, um, in our community lighting, we only had one uh, solicitation or one proposal submitted as well. So in an effort to ensure that we're getting the most competitive pricing, we did opt to repost those. And next, I just want to give you um, a little more detail about the two programs that will be um, implemented. We anticipate that these should be starting in um, April. 
uh, mid-April probably. It depends on when we have the service agreement. And for the direct install, we will be bringing that service agreement due to the, the size of that contract uh, back to the board for approval. And essentially what this does is it offers um, energy efficient uh, upgrades to small and mid-sized commercial customer facilities up to um, $2,500 per business. What we'll do is we'll come out and pr perform an energy assessment and we'll look at the existing lighting and the equipment then make recommendations on uh, upgrades based on a predetermined list of energy efficiency measures and all those measures could fall in those four different categories. If you hit just the retrofits real quick. And these are just some of the things that um, will be included in uh, the different options that would be available for them. Um, here's just a list of all the different ways that the customers can um, benefit. In addition to what's identified here, they'll also get a copy of the audit report um, if and when they have funding that may be available uh, for installation of other recommendations that are included in the report. Um, this will be kicked off in two particular cities and with a plan of expanding to neighboring communities uh, once funding becomes available. We've selected the city of La Quinta and the city of Imperial with a 75-25 participation approach. Um, essentially 75% of the uh, participants for this program will be selected by the IID and also uh, in coordination with this city um, with the other 25% of the funding being available for customer requests. And this is just so that we can really target target um, strategically the customer class that has a higher demand. Um, next, quickly going through um, our second program that will be implemented is a dusk to dawn lighting program. Essentially, this just provides free outdoor light lighting that's programmed to operate um, from dusk to dawn. They can't change the um, hours of operation on this. And um, we'd go out and again do conduct a, a full energy assessment of the facility, um, but we would also be providing them with um, a free wall pack light fixture with a protective shield, and that's essentially just to prevent vandalism, and here's a sample of the um, light itself. And they would also receive um, free installation by the contractor. We've only got a budget of 235% or $235,000, and we're estimating that it would cost about $400 per unit, although we anticipate that this may change a little bit based on what the actual bids come in at. Um, here's a list of all the ways that the customers benefit. Um, yeah, and we can read that at our yeah, register, so yeah, just yeah. go on. Um, again, we've selected two cities to kick this off. Uh, for this, we've uh, chosen the city of El Centro primarily because the El Centro Police Department has a very progressive anti-graffiti campaign, so we felt that that would be a natural fit for this particular program. And also the city of um, Indio, because we work with them on some of their grant funding programs that uh, have to focus on energy efficiency. And again, we'll plan to um, expand to neighboring communities. Oh, and just to point out, this is a program that's offered by um, most other utilities for graffiti control. Um, the next programs that we plan on bringing out will be in third quarter and fourth quarter. We'll be br bringing these back to you to give you just a brief update on what they are um, prior to implementation. Okay. And we um, gave the same presentation at the ECAC me meeting last night and got some really good feedback. Okay. Thank you. Any comments or questions from the board at this time? Not. Thank you. It was very informative and went very quickly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't think I could speak much faster. You know, you could be like those commercials when you're buying something. The little ears. Yes. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> moving on to, uh, let me see, right? I got lost. It would be number nine under action, governance, internal auditing, general matters. Yes. Page 75. Yes, what I'll do is I have a work list of the items that we're working on currently in internal auditing, and I thought maybe I'd pass this out to you. You could look at it, ask questions, or ask questions later based on uh, how we're proceeding here with the, uh, okay. with the meeting. So. Thank you, Tom. Working process. I do. Thank you. Thank you.
I can briefly go over this with you, or you can yeah. look at that and ask me questions if you'd like, whichever you wish. Any questions or comments from the board? No, I... Anything you want to include or, or exclude? Or I, I'm, I feel comfortable with this list. Okay. That's fine. Uh, and uh, you, can, you can call or email me if you want some backup on this or you have additional questions as to the status of it. Okay. Just feel free to give me a call. Okay. That goes for the general manager too. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to item number 10. Do we have to vote to, uh, to adopt to, uh, it, it's, it's an action item? Yes. Do we need a motion to I, approve? I, yes. Okay. Um, I, I, I think, uh, I, I expect some of the directors might want an explanation at least of what the changes were. Um, and I know I of asked. What? No, I'm talking about. I'm, I'm going oh. back to internal audit. Do, since Make it's a motion just to just accept his report. Just to accept report? Okay. Did you, is that a motion or? Yes. Is I'll there a second? Second? To, second? Discussion? Please vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Okay, now we go to item number 10, page 76. Adoption of amended Appendix A-1 to District's Conflict of Interest Code. Uh, Mr. Taylor. Be, be, before you get started, may I ask a question? Sure. Uh, are we going to give this same presentation in El Centro? If you want us to. Sure, uh, we can do that. Um, I, I think we were under under the gun to get moving on this. That's the only reason we're doing this up here. But whatever the board wishes is fine with us. Okay. Is there a, a time limit on this? Or there, is there? April 1st is our deadline for getting the statements filed. Um, we've already started uh, the background work on that. Um, we're getting them distributed to the employees and the committee members. Um, and I believe uh, Gloria has the 700 forms for the board members. Um, we just uh, wanted to come briefly before the board and request um, that the board adopt an amended Appendix A because uh, the organization has changed a little bit over the last year. There's been some positions added, some eliminated. Uh, we really haven't done anything to try to expand the scope of the Conflict of Interest Code uh, or to uh, narrow it for that matter. It's just really a matter of trying to get the correct positions designated in light of the reorganizations that have taken place over the last year. Okay. Uh, when it comes back for information in El Centro, could we see a side-by-side -side comparison of the additions? I, I, in the absolutely. I think we have that now, and I hope we bring it back for action, not for information. But if you're asking us... Well, this is under action today. It's under action for today. Now, if you don't want to take action today, you want to. are you asking us to bring it back to El Centro? Because we I, can do we that. We can... I'm ready to vote on it today. Yeah, right because but the Marcy, do you have a? We I do have a spreadsheet. We have something for you, Director Desert, if if that would be helpful. Uh, because if you're under the gun uh, by April 1st, mm -hmm. I, I, do we yes, have I have for, copies. But go ahead and let's hand that out. Okay. Because we did, at your request, we did prepare a comparison so you could see the changes. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Well, you're going to have to disclose your beach house in Florida. No, <laughs> oh, you have to find it.
Yes, Mr. Garber, this this handouts. I guess that's fans. We'd be voting on this to approve this too. No, the no, handout sir. is to explain all that's changed here. Is the conflict of interest code has not changed. The list of the people who fill out the form right. has been modified to reflect organizational changes, and that work has really been done mostly by HR um, and Marcy Rivera. And so, um, this document just tells you how we changed the list from the list that was in the code of conduct previously. And as you can see, most of it is adding or deleting titles to track changes in organizational structure and titles. Um, I don't think that anybody who had to fill out the form before doesn't have to fill it out now, but to the extent that their position or title changed, we tried to reflect that. Is that an accurate statement, Marcy? That, that's true. This reflects the organization. Come to the, to the podium, please, Mr. Rivera. As you can see on the on the column there, it's all all it is is the reflection of the organizational changes that occurred due to the water reorganization, some of the uh, reclassifications that occurred during the year. So that's why you see a lot of activity or a lot of changes in the water department. But the actual employees completing the the 700 form are pretty much the same people, except that they have different titles to right. it. Okay, now, that's fine. Do, do, now, do the, the consultants that work for the district, do they also have to uh, complete a 700 yes, form? Yes, but we don't have a list of those consultants. Um, that's a department by department requirement. We don't know who they are ahead of time, so that's set out in the code of conduct, and that's by by what they do and the, and the type of work they do. Okay, now this list is only district employees, um, the, yep. the, the managers and employees. What you're asking for us to take action, the code itself hasn't changed, you just had these. Appendix A is the only thing the, that has been okay, updated. It's really I'll an update from last year. It's not approval. really changed. Is there a second? I'll second. I have a uh, Discussion? Yeah, I've got a discussion. Is there a separate appendix for the Department by department, or for the consultants or legal? No. no. Um, it, uh, I, there is a section in which the, um, the different departments have to identify who their consultants are. We don't know. And there's um, which section? A2 is the uh, <coughs> appendix that deals with consultants. Yeah. You might want to refer to it, uh, section A2. Um, this is the code of conduct that we revised two years ago. Uh, it was 2000, December of 2009 right. that we adopted this. Can we bring this back for action next week, or is that too too long? <laughs> whatever the board. No, I'm just. I'm just. What, uh, whatever it, the pleasure the board is. Vote on it today. Uh, get it it over seems to it. me that they they just specified they need this right away because yeah. April 1st. I, 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 I don't mind coming back or, uh, or not, meeting with Mr. you, Mr. private Garber, director. Mr. Garber, I, I'm talking to. I'm sorry. Uh, if you want to take action now and you want to meet Mr. private. Garber, we have a we have a motion, a second on the table. Uh, yes, right now. Okay, let me. Continue with my meeting. Um, so the the only difference is that you're deleting some of the positions that are no longer in human resources. Yes, uh, are no longer um, active throughout the organization. Yes, it's an update of Appendix A. It's only an update. Yes, and Director and it deals only with IID employees. Does not deal with consultants. That's a difference appendix. Yes, that's there, appendix I, yes. A two, which A2. remains unchanged. Okay. Have, yeah. Yes, um, Director Sanchez. Do we have um, like a seminar for these people who fill out the seven hundred forms um, when it comes to investing? For example, I don't. I, I would hate to see that. Uh, Officer safety services not invest in Ford stock because the district is going to go out and buy 30 Fords from El Central Motors and then be accused of uh, a conflict of interest. That would not necessarily be a problem. Um, I know we do field calls usually in the springtime from a lot of people asking us for advice. I know Vance does a lot of that. Um, but um, we don't do a seminar because it, it's kind of a person by person thing. They just ask questions to help them fill them, fill it out. We have a lot of materials that get handed out with the Form 700 that goes page by page from the FPPC, and usually that stuff is pretty detailed. And 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 Director Sanchez, um, also the the website um, for for this is has a lot of valuable information that we also refer the the employees that have questions like today we were we were asked you know do I have to report my rental 
So I said, you know, um, yes, you do, but it has to be a certain value. So we got on the internet, and it has a lot of va uh, valuable information. And then we also consult with Vance uh, when there's questions, more complicated, more technical questions. They'll give us a legal opinion about those things. Okay. Any other comments or questions from the board, Director Hanks? Yeah, I don't. I just don't believe this is keeping with what we promised the public about taking care of water business in uh, La Quinta. You know, the I don't I don't remember ever having a question about conflict of interest uh, at a meeting here, but we have had numerous questions from the public, um, at, from people that are associated with the water side. Well, what we can do is vote on this today. They bring it back uh, for the next board meeting. For information, I guess, and because you say time is of the the essence in this, the, the, with this particular. I item. don't think that um, moving us back a week would necessarily slow us down, though. I mean, we've we've sort of proceeded on the um, assumption. Why did you tell me you needed it? Yeah, that's the I'll make the everybody happy. The I'll pull my motion so everybody's happy. Okay. Do you we'll want to pull your no second control. and bring it back to the next meeting? Um, oh, just for the energy. No, 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 no we're, it's too complicated. We're assuming that you're going to adopt no, these central. changes, and we are identifying the people that are already identified here as people who need to fill out the Form 700s. Um, do, do it so now, if central. you want to put it off in a week, that's fine. Yeah, and I apologize. Week. I didn't know, Director Hanks, I didn't give it that much thought that it would be an issue that would be best brought up. Well, I, I had a couple central. of phone calls and just asked, them, you know, asked me that question. I thought, well, I'll bring it up. Okay. I've already brought it, up it, some water yeah. issues um, here the, earlier this my morning. Suggestion yeah, is we to me, it didn't matter. I could have voted for it today. This. It's not an issue, but it makes the board happy. We'll take it to yeah. the, the El Centro next week. Yes, ma'am. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to item number 11, page 99. Um, Dr. Koch, 2011 Coachella Valley Energy Summit sponsorship. Uh, yes, ma'am, President. Move for approval. Second. Sec okay. Is there a uh, discussion? Please vote. All, All right. in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Oh. Motion. Did you get <laughs> what? <laughs> Was my eye for oppose or for? So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Uh, thank you, Mark. You're welcome. And I believe that concludes our meeting, correct? Uh, oh, we're adjourned public session. Stay tuned for closed session.